I doubt many people even actually remember this place existed, but before the days of Barnes & Noble, the biggest bookstore chain in the country was Crown Books. They discounted every book they sold, and that was the reason why they were able to become so big for so long. The company, however, closed down in 2001. I used to be the manager of such a Crown Bookstore. It was really the best job I ever had. Sure, it didn't pay the best, but the work itself was very satisfying and fun. I honestly looked forward to going into work every single day. I worked with some really smart students, too. It was a huge change from the previous fast food jobs I'd been employed in. Anyway, when the store was in its final throes, there wasn't a lot of money to go around. Because of this, every manager worked the shift by themselves. I took a lot of the closing shifts because I was a night owl already. I almost always let all the employees go home early, so I would be by myself in the store for about an hour or so, finishing up the last bits of work. These days, it seems bookstores have shelves that people can see over. The Crown Bookstore I worked in, though, was not like this. The shelves were all extremely high, and you couldn't even tell if there was anyone in the store with you. On the night this happened, I had one of my employees go up and down the aisles and check the bathrooms, just to make sure there was no customers left in the store. When he confirmed there was no one else inside, I let the employee out the door, then made sure the lobby lights were all off. I went into the back room to do the final paperwork for the day. Although I liked being in the store by myself, I had to admit it could be a bit frightening at times. The back room had one of those combination locks on it though, so no matter what I would always be fine back there at least. I was doing my paperwork when I suddenly realized there was a book that had been special ordered that had been shelved recently. I went out in the store in order to look for it and retrieve it. There were a few security lights on in the store, but they didn't provide much light at all. I didn't turn on any of the other lights either. They weren't supposed to be on after the store was closed. The book was a diet book, I guess, so I went over to the self-help section, which is where books like that were normally kept. I walked down the first aisle and turned the corner checking through all the books to find the one I needed. I noticed it wasn't on the shelf where it was supposed to be, though. I turned the other corner and then checked on that side to see if the book was misplaced by a shelf or two or something. I did end up finding it hidden away eventually. I then walked up to the front of the store, and I could not convey how creepy this was walking through the store at night. I don't believe in ghosts myself, but I've often thought that if a ghost were to exist, a bookstore at night would be the perfect atmosphere for him or her to hang out in. Walking around in this dark store with limited view, every little shadow freaked me out. Every little noise got my attention. Walking around the gigantic stacks of books, I was happy when I arrived at the front registers. We were supposed to keep all special orders right there. So I pulled out a slip and began writing the order up. I'm not sure why I did it, but I suddenly raised my head up in that moment to look over at the security monitor. There were four cameras in the store. My blood nearly froze in my veins when I saw someone was hiding in the self-help aisle, the one I had just walked out of. There was a gigantic figure, maybe over six foot tall, dressed in all black, and clearly holding some sort of weapon in their hand. I wasn't sure what to do. I should have just left the store and called the police right away. I didn't want to do it in the store though. If the guy heard me, he would come after me right away. I considered doing it instead in the back room in the combination door. I would be safe there. The self-help section was on the complete opposite side of the store too so I could probably get to the back room before he even realized what I was doing. After standing there for a moment, I leapt over the counter and began booking it for the back room. It was down a short hallway. I got to the door with no problem. I typed in the four-digit code and turned the handle. Just as I did so, I caught rapid movement out of the corner of my eye. 
I saw the man running at the end of the short hallway. I swung the door open and ran in, forcing it closed behind me. I immediately saw the handle begin wiggling violently. The man was clearly trying to get in. When he realized he couldn't, he tried to type in the code a few times. Then he started pounding loudly on the door. I wasn't worried about the guy getting through. It was made to keep people out after all. I called the police, and they immediately sent a car over. When they arrived, the guy was still there and was just deciding to leave the store through the front door. He must have unlocked it himself. They arrested him immediately. Turns out the item he was carrying was a very sharp knife. It took me a long time to be okay working alone again. I used to work in a Borders bookstore. I was an assistant manager. One of my favorite people working at the store was a lady in charge of the children's section. She was a pleasant lady and actually was very popular with everyone working there. The kids liked her a lot too. She did story time every week and many kids came in to watch this woman with her amazingly friendly personality. One thing about the story time that no one really liked, though, were the costumes. We were sent costumes for certain stories, and were supposed to occasionally incorporate them into story time. No one really liked to wear them, though, because they always seemed really dirty. We never had any real idea how old they were, or where they had been before. We didn't know how many people might have worn them, either. Finding anyone to play with them was never that easy because of this. The costumes would always be shipped in these huge boxes, and as manager, I was one of the people who had to sign for them when they arrived. On the day this weird stuff happened, I had heard the back buzzer. Upon going back there, I noticed the gigantic box and brought it inside. Curiously, I opened it up. It was a really ugly and scary looking thing. Some sort of humanoid character with a gigantic head. I wish I could recall what children's book the character was supposed to be from, but I can't bring it out of my memory. There was another thing that was creepy about it though, and although most workers didn't want to wear the costumes to begin with, they especially didn't want to be anywhere near this one. Even the people who could usually be convinced were adamant this was not one they were willing to put on. When no one else would agree to do it, to keep the story time happening, the story lady decided she would wear the costume instead. That was, if I was willing to read the story to the children. It wasn't something I had ever done before, but I was definitely willing to try. About an hour before story time, the story lady went into the back room to put the costume on. I went and grabbed a copy of the book, at the story time, when the children had all gathered around, the story lady still hadn't showed up yet. When she finally did, she was very odd as well. She was kind of stumbling around a lot. I assumed it was just her acting like the character, whom I wasn't very familiar with to begin with. I began reading the book soon after. The person playing the character was supposed to have the kids sit on their lap and play with them but the old lady didn't sit down. Instead, she seemed to be waving to the kids with shaking hands. After a few moments, she almost fell over onto one of them. I was so confused, but thought maybe she had just lost her balance in the costume. I had this horrible thought cross my mind that maybe it wasn't really her inside or something. Maybe someone might have done something to her in the dressing room, but that didn't really make sense. There wasn't any way anyone could have gotten into our stockroom. However, just as suddenly, she fell down onto her knees. I was concerned and approached her, and that was when I noticed the sound of her vomiting inside the suit. The kids were all getting freaked out now and moved away. I helped her to get the costume hat off. The lady looked terrible. She was sweating and was a strange shade of red. I thought perhaps she had been suffocating inside. I tried to help her to the back room while calling another manager over to try and take care of the children in the meanwhile. I managed to get her into the stock room. I moved her over to a chair. 
We just happened to be beside the box the costume came in. She was looking more awful by the second. I called an ambulance immediately. Upon further examining the costume out of getting her out of it, and the box it came in, I found the tip of a razor. It had been stuck inside the costume, and apparently it had been laced with poison. The lady recalled feeling a sharp pain when putting the costume on initially, but thought maybe it was just a broken zipper or something inside. She didn't think it was anything to worry about. We had to get the police involved obviously at that point. We knew some sick individual had put that razor in there. However, there wasn't enough information to find out who. The story lady thankfully recovered just fine, but we never got another person in the store to agree to wear a costume ever again. I live in a large city. There's a homeless woman who I used to see at one of my express to local subway transfers on the way home. There always seemed to be something off about her. She wore a towel on her head usually, like how people with long hair would after they took a shower. Also, it definitely wasn't a religious head covering of any kind. It was clearly just a towel, as if the woman had just walked out freshly wet and strolled down to the subway platform. She would run all around the station, asking for money, repeating help me, help me in a really high-pitched voice in an unrecognizable accent. Late one night, I was switching from the express train to the local and got on the subway when I noticed this woman had followed me in. I walked to the end of the car and started to read my book. She came up and began asking me for money like usual. Only, I actually didn't have any on me this time. No cash, no change, only a debit card. It's at this time I realized we were the only two people in this subway car, and the doors connecting the cars wouldn't open. Okay. I figured I'd just get out at the next stop if she became too aggressive. No problem. She came up to me and started asking for money in her high-pitched cartoonish voice again. I told her that I had nothing to give her, and I was really sorry. I began nervously waiting for the subway to reach the next stop as she started pacing around. Only, this train was now running express until the end of the line, six stops worth. She didn't seem to realize this though, and walked over to punch the subway doors, screaming at the top of her lungs. All of a sudden, she turned back toward me. There was no accent or high-pitched voice this time. She looked me dead in the eyes and just started screaming, DIE! in a really angry and deep voice. She began trying to attack me, and for the entire seven minutes it took for the train to reach the station, I had to hold her off the entire time. After it stopped, I immediately took off running while she stayed behind in the car. She used to be a permanent fixture at that stop, but ever since that incident, I've never seen her since. In 2003, I was working as a stripper in the Phoenix area. I had been dancing for almost a year and was still getting the hang of how to get the most money from a regular with the least amount of clinginess reciprocated. I was working on and off at four different places, club one, two, three, and four for reference, alternating day shifts and night shifts, depending on money. One night shift, this skinny, scraggly-looking guy comes in and hones in on me right away. From the way he was bouncing and twitching in his seat, even in the lighting of the club, it was clear he was a meth addict, and he must have been higher than my heels were. No biggie, I was raised by meth addicts after all, so as long as he was happy, should be some easy money. We go to VIP, chat, I relieve him of his paycheck and he goes on his way. Next night he's back again, and looking for me specifically. I get his name, Steve, and tell him my name, Tori, my fake backstory and head back again. He told me he was a truck driver, and only in town a few days a month. We have a perfectly nice, if not jittery, time. 
No red flags, really. Everyone goes home fairly happy. Repeat the next night, and then I don't see him again for a month. This whole routine continued for about four months. Eventually, he started bringing in the finest gas station meth addict approved gifts when he came in to see me. By this point, he was also serenading me half the time instead of having me dance for him. His favorite was Picture by Kid Rock and Cheryl Crow. Thankfully, I spent a lot of time with my back to him, so I could only hear snippets of his impassioned baritone. The singing was creepy, not just because it was always on repeat. He would always change the lyrics to be specific to me. The longer he sang, the more grabby he would get as well. Not anywhere illegal, mind you, but like grabbing my face and forcing me to stare at him. Pressing my hand to his heart, trying to press his hand to mine. By the end of this month's visit, he asked me to move in with him. He told me he just wanted to have me at his house all the time. He must have envisioned himself as the typical customer in shining armor, telling me he wants to save me and take me away from all this. I decided to be a little more honest with him and explain to him I was already in a relationship and not interested in men either. Particularly, I was not interested in him. He then told me he'd let me keep my girlfriend. All he'd need to do was keep me three days a month when he was in town. Obviously, I shut him down immediately. He started begging me to think about it, and that he'd hear my final decision when he got back next month. After that, I asked the manager to ban him. Unfortunately, without a pick of him on hand at all times, that was pretty much impossible. I settled for alerting the security bartender and manager to give me a warning if they saw him around asking for me again. When his time of the month came around again, I switched to a different shift at other clubs to avoid him. When I went back to Club One the next week after he was supposed to have left, a couple of plastic grocery bags were there waiting for me. They were full of notes scrawled on crumpled, dirty scraps of paper. They also had small stuffed animals, silk roses, roses made of panties, mismatched taped together greeting cards and other random detritus. There was also like a 50 page barely legible letter professing his love, insisting again I move to his place right now. I was sufficiently creeped out at this point and happy I'd managed to miss him this month. The following month rolled around and I ditched what had become my regular club in order to avoid ever seeing him again. I was now working the day shift at club two good money from lots of bored people on their lunch breaks. It was getting to the last couple of hours of my shift and was pretty slow. I was on stage, not really paying attention as I finished up my routine. Because of this, I didn't see him until I was heading downstairs to get off stage. I noticed him a few feet in front of me, waving and yelling my name over and over. There was no way to get around him either. As soon as I got to the bottom of the stairs, he grabbed me up in a big hug, obviously surprising me. I did not want him touching me, but he wouldn't let go and kept on gripping fistfuls of my hair and smelling it. I pushed away from him and started to tell him that my shift was over. That was my last stage, and I was going home now. He looked very upset. He said he just wanted to hang out with me before he had to leave town tonight. I told him he'd have to pay extra for me to sit with him, whether I'm dancing or not. He agreed, and I went and gave the bartender and security a heads up that this guy was the creepy stalker guy I'd been talking about. Instead of having me actually dance for him, he had me straddle him while we talked. He was unusually shaky and jumpy this time, so I resorted to making him sit on his hands so he wouldn't touch me. He proceeded to tell me how he'd been searching every club in the city looking for me this month, how he'd asked various people if his girlfriend Tori was there. He told me he'd had his house all cleaned up and ready for me to move into. I reminded him again that I was not moving in with him, and he excitedly replied, Well, you just don't know you want to right now. I again reminded him of my girlfriend, who I was making plans to move with. He said that our whole lives were about to change now that we'd found each other. 
Between all this conversation, he'd begun singing again. Despite the money, I decided he was being way too crazy this time, and I was done with everything. I really needed to get home. Before I could get up, though, he wrapped his arms around my waist, literally picked me up in the air, and started running with me towards the exit. I was screaming, trying to flag down the bartender, DJ, or anyone, because security wasn't there all of a sudden. He'd made it out to the hallway, only about ten feet from the door, when the massive security guard stepped back inside from walking a girl to her car. He tried to dart around the guard still carrying me. I reached for security, while Steve tried to pull me away and out the door. Thankfully, the brick wall of a security guard managed to plant himself in front of us and pulled me out of Steve's arms before he could try anything else. He insisted he was just joking, and he was only trying to tell me goodbye. I bolted out of there and into the dressing room, though, while he was still screaming for me to come say goodbye to him. The security guard practically carried him one-handed outside. Thankfully, he was banned for good this time. I decided to take a vacation with my girlfriend for a couple months after, just in case he tried to follow me again and stuff me into his trunk or something. He continued to call all the clubs looking for me while I was gone. They all lied and said I quit working there, and I didn't see him again after. When I was a teenager, my parents were pretty permissive about what I could and could not do. I guess I should just say what I could do, as they never really bothered to tell me what I couldn't do anyway. Because of this, after school, I would spend all my time at my best friend Reed's house. He had a lot more video game systems than I did and more variety of games to play, so I could spend hours and hours in his parents' basement with him, playing them all night long. I would then walk home really late at night. My entire family would generally be asleep around this time. This was a regular thing for many years, so by the time this story happened, it was pretty much routine. There was one thing I always noticed on the way home, though. That was, there was this house that was a completely normal-looking house. Didn't really look any different than any houses you'd see around it. I wasn't really out of place either. For some reason though, for the entire four years from junior high school to now, the house had always been for sale. No one seemed to ever live in it no matter what. I know you know about places like this. People see houses that are unoccupied and they make up all sorts of stories about them. I don't believe in that sort of thing though. You know, the whole house is haunted so no one wants to buy it sort of thing. Regardless of what I believe, though, I can tell you that it was a creepy and imposing sight, sitting there all lonely and unoccupied. When I was around 17 years old on a Friday night, I'd been over at Reed's house really late. It was a weekend, so it was around 2 a.m. or so. I began making my way back home. I was immediately surprised, though, with just how foggy it was outside that night. I suppose the fog was rolling in because it was beginning to get quite cold outside lately, and the ground was still warm from the day. It was so foggy it was hard to see where I was going. I had made this walk thousands of times though, and it was like second nature to me. I even knew the exact moment I passed by that house that was always for sale. When I did so, a random thought occurred to me. I began to wonder what that house might look like covered in a deep fog like this. It was certainly spooky looking to begin with. I reached into my bag to grab my cell phone and turned on the light, shining it at the direction of the house. Turned out it did look pretty spooky. The light from my phone was also shining off the fog, which was giving it a cool looking effect too. It was then when my gaze lowered to the for sale sign. It had a sign on it now in addition that said it was reduced price. For some reason, I thought this was weird. I guess it didn't have to be. A house being on sale for years would of course be reduced because no one wanted to buy it. At the time, I just thought it was really weird for some reason, though. Although I eventually walked home and got out of the fog, I couldn't get it out of my head how weird I thought it was. 
When I brought it up to Reed, he said it didn't surprise him. According to him, the reason why the house was empty was because a family was murdered there or something and it was haunted. Of course, the typical answer any kid who didn't actually know what happened would give for why a house was going unsold. I never really bought it, though. You know, the whole Amityville house never went unsold. It was bought within a year of the murders. Then, a year after that family moved out, it was inhabited constantly afterwards. Each of the three next owners living 10 to 20 years in the residence. It's all a made-up story. I didn't buy that crap about murder houses going empty. I went home, but I did tell Reed about it the other day. He just fell back on the murder story again, and the possibility the place might be haunted or whatever. While we played video games, he kept going back to the topic though, and suggested maybe I should try breaking into the house and checking it out myself. Stuff like that, I have to admit, I had begun thinking about recently. That night, as I walked home, it was just as foggy as it had been that other time. When I went by the house, I began thinking about what Reed had said earlier. It was quite tempting in the moment. I honestly wanted to go and see if there really was anything weird about this house. I decided to do it. I thought it would be better to enter through the backyard. If I was going to break in and enter a home, even an empty one, it seemed best to do it from a place that no one else would see you. I went around the back and tried to find an easy way to get in. I was surprised when I found that one of the windows was actually unlocked and there was no screen either. I opened up the window and dragged myself into the house. I didn't turn on any of the lights. I guess I assumed the electricity wouldn't even be on at this point. I began looking around the house. There was nothing weird about it really. It was really dark and dusty though. I supposed it hadn't had a good cleaning in a long while. Maybe that's why it hadn't sold. There was nothing obvious in it, though, that indicated to me why no one would want to live in this house. That's when I walked into the living room, and I saw it. In the far corner of the room, there was a man. He was leaned up against the corner, one leg splayed and the other crooked. He had a knife in his hand and was using it to whittle a piece of wood. As my eyes adjusted, I could tell he was staring right at me. I couldn't make out all the details of his face because it was so dark, but before I could react in any way, the man called out in a scary voice. What the fuck are you doing in my house? He jumped to his feet quicker than I thought possible and rushed at me with his knife. He would have easily caught me if my flight instinct hadn't kicked in right then. I jumped out of the window like Superman and landed on the ground. Looking back, I saw him catching up to the window. One of his legs was already out, as if he were coming after me. I did the only thing I could think to do. I booked it and ran like the great Jesse Owens, and no one could catch me in this moment. I didn't stop until my candy ass was home. No, I didn't call the police either. I had no idea what to tell them. The only person I talked to about this was Reed, and he didn't believe me. He thought I was just trying to scare him like he always did to me and I can't exactly blame him. After that, I began taking a different way to my friend's house, and I never walked by that home again. So right off, I don't have a freaking car, and it really sucks. Whenever I go anywhere, I always have to go by foot, and it gets old pretty quickly. Anyhow, I didn't write this out to complain about that, though. I wrote it to tell you all about something that happened to me one night when I was walking alone in the fog. I live in a small town. I think the biggest thing about my town is that it's just off an exit to a major highway. So, right off the exit, there are a lot of fast food restaurants and gas stations. Of course, a lot of out-of-towners stop by and shop there. When the nighttime hits, though, it's like a ghost town. I was sitting at home, up really late at night. I had slept all day and was looking for something to do. I was out of beer and figured I should walk to the gas station and get me some more. So I set out walking. You know, we usually don't have really thick fogs around this area, but this one was so thick I could only see a foot or two in front of my face. It was like the fog you read about in stories, but you never really see in real life. 
I almost even changed my mind about going. I realized, though, just how much I really wanted that beer, so I kept on trucking on. I got to the end of my neighborhood and began walking along the highway. Now, remind you, this wasn't the freeway they got off of, this was the highway. So, this late at night, it was pretty empty. I had to go over a bridge that spanned a train track in a forest, then down a short hill in order to get to the gas station. I was walking, and had just made it to the bridge. Keep in mind, it was still difficult to see anything as I went along, so this bridge crossing was much more intimidating than usual. As I was walking, I started to smell something strange. It took me a few moments to figure out exactly what it was, though. It smelled like wood burning. My grandma used to have a wood burning stove in her living room, and it smelled almost exactly like that. I thought that was pretty odd. What was someone doing out here in a forest burning something under the bridge? What if a forest fire started or something? I thought maybe I should go and check this out. I made my way to the far side of the bridge. Once I got there, I looked down the hill, which was fairly steep. I wondered if it was too steep to climb down in the fog. I'd never actually been down this area before. I walked a little bit down in the fog, racing myself against some trees as I went down the hill with each step. I considered turning around and making my way back up the hill, but the smell just got stronger as I went further down. I honestly thought there might be a small forest fire or something, and I should check it out to make sure and report it. Maybe I would even be able to do something about it. All of a sudden, though, I heard a loud voice yelling at me. Who the hell are you? I looked around, but was unable to find anyone in the thick fog. I slipped a bit on the hill when I heard it, and fell on my butt. I looked up again, only to see the hugest man I had ever seen in my lifetime, silhouetted in the fog. He was quickly making his way up the hill. I scampered to my feet, getting mud all over me. I kept my eyes on this figure as I got up, and tried to turn around. What the hell did you see? The man asked me as he continued making his way up the hill. What the hell did you see? I didn't see anything, I replied. I turned around and tried to get up the hill, but I fell down on my face again. I got up and started climbing as best as able. Once I got back to the road, I ran across it real quickly. There was a big diesel that crossed the street right after me. He honked his horn at me as if I was in his way. When the truck had passed by, I looked back across the road. I saw the shadow of the man in the fog, but that was all. I turned and ran to the gas station. I told what happened to the skeptical cashier, who thankfully still called the police. If something was going down under that bridge, they needed to know. The police found a wood-filled fire under the bridge, and a bunch of dead animals as well. But that was all. It was just a terrifying thing to experience. I can honestly say I never want to experience anything like that ever again. Okay, so this is a little weird and I can understand immediately if some people might not believe me, but I have to let you know it's 100% true and is also scary as well. This happened a long time ago, but I've always remembered it. Mostly because of a scene from Stephen King's It. That memory prevented me from telling this story out of fear, but I decided to finally share it. I remember when I first moved out of my parents' house, and I got a dirty little studio apartment in a crappy part of town, on the full other side of the city. I got a job working at a Taco Bell, and I worked a late night shift. This meant I was always walking home late at night. The area I lived in tended to get really foggy. It wasn't so bad that you couldn't see where you were going at all. It was just pretty annoying. Sometimes, though, it could be really cool, dependent on what mood you were in. Since this was a late night, the store closed at 4 in the morning. Needless to say, I was pretty damn exhausted. There were several of us there. The rest of the guys told me they could tell I was tired and told me to leave early while they cleaned up. I was so tired as I left the store, I just edged along as normal. This early in the dark morning, the fog was still present as I was walking along. I didn't think about it too much, though. I was too exhausted to think. 
I just wanted to get home and rest. I was walking along the side of the road in the gutter. Once I arrived home, I would probably fall asleep right away. It didn't help that my eyes were going in and out of focus in the fog. When I snapped out of it, though, I could have sworn I could hear someone talking. Yeah, someone talking isn't a big deal, but when you're walking alone in the dark at 4am and you suddenly hear something like that, it startles you. I tried to listen, and I began to hear something again. It was definitely a voice. I looked around trying to see if anyone was there. Yeah, it was foggy, but like I said, it wasn't so foggy I couldn't see around at all. No matter how hard I looked though, I kept hearing this voice, but I couldn't see where it was coming from. Finally, I followed the voice, enough to get around to where it was coming from. When I got there, and I finally saw where the voice was emerging from, I could tell it was more than one voice. As I got even closer, I noticed it seemed to be coming from underneath a sewer grate. I walked right over to the sewer, and leaned in a bit to hear better what they were saying. This was so weird, imagining that someone was down there talking right now. I didn't even know this part of the sewer was big enough to let people walk around in. Then again, I suppose that's what manholes are for. They wouldn't be there otherwise. I looked down through the holes in the grating, trying to get a better picture of what was going on. When I finally began to make out what was being said, I froze. I'll never forget. It was very distinct. Go on, grab his legs. We have to make sure no one ever finds him. Even though it was foggy, and even though it was dark, I could see someone in the sewer carrying something large. I now had to assume this was another person, and clearly they were not alone. As they passed underneath the grate I was above, one of the men looked right up, and my eyes met his. We stared at each other for over a second, before I realized I needed to get the hell out of there. I was much closer to the Taco Bell than I was to home, so I took off running and ran to the Taco Bell. My co-workers, of course, didn't believe me and wouldn't let me use the phone to call the cops. I couldn't use it on my own because only the manager had permission to use it, and he wouldn't let me by the time I got a ride home from my friend. I kind of just gave up on the idea of it, and the guys had to be long gone anyway. There was no way I was going to find them. So whatever they were doing, I guess they got away with it in the end. This is about a really freaky experience I had while working at the Barnes & Noble in Crystal Lake, Illinois. I remember working at the information deck on this day, when I received a phone call and answered it. The person on the other end claimed to be a person working for a local newspaper. I would later find out that this was not true. It was in actuality a person working at the Borders Bookstore in Gurney, Illinois. I only found this out because one of my good friends worked at that store and told me about it happening. The guy from the Borders store asked me about the store being haunted. I told him I'd never heard of such a thing. He asked to speak to a manager. I was right beside the manager in that moment, who did tell him that the haunting was just a rumor and there was no validity to it. After the phone call, I asked the manager what that was all about, and she told me the store had a reputation for being haunted. Employees who worked there before her reported it often. It had even been written about in a book of some sort. I guess around Halloween time they always got calls from people asking about the haunting. It was simple things like book carts being moved without anyone being around, or books falling off the shelves when they had no reason to be doing that. I guess there were some sorts of physical entities that were supposed to appear as well. Supposedly a blue ball of light, or an old man who looked like a farmer. All of the current employees at the store had never seen anything though, so it was all considered to be made up bullshit. I'm not going to be one of those people who claims they didn't believe in ghosts before my experience. Honestly, whenever I hear someone claim that, I roll my eyes. I seriously doubt they were skeptical to begin with, and they just claim that in order to make their story seem more believable. I'm going to admit straight up that I did believe in ghosts, although I'd never actually experienced a haunting before. I just felt a world in which ghosts existed was a lot more interesting than one in which they did not. 
It was about a week later when I was working on a closing shift. I had begun reorganizing our manga and graphic novel section, which had a tendency to get messed up. The managers always had to keep one employee in the store with them after closing. I wasn't done with my work, so I agreed to stay behind. It generally took the manager an hour and a half to finish working, and I intended to use that time to get all my work done. The store was always dark after closing. You know, you can't let people think the store is still open. I have to admit, it was pretty creepy, sitting in that big dark store all alone. The manager was in the back office, and the office door was locked because he was counting money. I finally finished the majority of my work. Then, I noticed that once I had everything shelved, there was a large empty spot. I'd worked so hard at that point that I wanted to go and get some more books, just to make it perfect. There weren't any on the book cards though, so I had to go to the back room. Our back room was huge and had tons of shelves. The shelves didn't have backs on them, so you could see all the way through to the other parts of the stock room. Still, they were sort of overstocked with books in some parts, so if someone had been there, it would have been easy for them to sneak up on you, I guess. I didn't really feel that anything like that was likely to happen, though. Just my own mind making up a fear from the atmosphere. The lighting was very dim in there. I didn't really think about turning more lights on, though. I'd been back there plenty of times and would only be there for a few moments anyway. It was really creepy in there at this moment. At the time, I had forgotten all about the whole haunted talk I had with the other manager. I went to the overstock shelf. They had the unshelved graphic novels on them. I picked up a small dolly's worth of books. I took some books and laid them down on the dolly. I think it was after I'd pretty much filled it up, when I stood back up and looked through the shelves, only to come face to face with a man standing on the other side. He was looking right at me, and he looked extremely angry. I yelled and nearly fell backward, taking my eyes off him for a moment. When I looked back up though, he was already gone. I thought he had to still be in the stock room, possibly coming around the shelf for me. I left the graphic novels behind and ran for the stock room door. I exited and ran to the office. I pounded on the door and when the manager opened, I told him someone was in the store with us. He had to still be in there too because the alarms would have been set off if he'd gone through the door. We barricaded ourselves in the office and looked through all the security cameras. The police came, and just like us, they couldn't find anything. One of the policemen told us he thought we were playing a prank because he had been called out a few years before for a very similar story. They found no one then either, and the alarms never went off either. The person couldn't have left. It was also an angry man who was spotted in the back room. We were freaked out. Most of the other employees didn't believe us though, and they thought I made it up because of receiving that phone call about the haunting. But no, I'm sure I really did see a man back there. My best friend Ted was such a really weird kid. I mean, I was too when I was really young. And that's how the two of us became best friends, really. We were both sort of nerdy, bookish types, and all the other kids thought we were weird. As strange as I was thought to be, though, Ted was a lot stranger than even I was. He had this fascination with really weird stuff that even sort of freaked me out. He liked a lot of death-related stuff, as well as abandoned buildings and all sorts of other things. We grew up in the same town all our lives, so we were together since we were really young. Therefore, we did almost everything together as well. We saw each other every single day, and so even though he was a bit weird, I don't think I trusted anyone as much as I trusted him. So, one day when we were both 14, he came over and asked me if I wanted to go check out this abandoned building. I was only slightly hesitant. Huh. I knew it was going to happen because we always did what the other wanted to do, but I did want to know beforehand what building he wanted to go to, and why he wanted to investigate this one in particular. It was some sort of old school building, closed down long before either of us was born. 
For many years after that, they sometimes held voting booths there. But it had been shut down and boarded up for many years before Ted suggested this adventure of ours. It was a very old building right on the outside of town, while the newer school building was built in town. I had never actually been inside this old building before. It had closed and boarded up long before we ever had the chance to go inside like I mentioned, and mostly I was kind of nervous about doing so. Hell, I didn't like walking through someone's yard, much less entering a building shut off from the public, but he was excited about going into it. Ted was interested in all this exploring stuff and got into that whole urban building exploration thing. This was really the only place around town that fit that description. We got in through a broken door in the back of the building. The brush and everything back there was very overgrown, and there was a lot of litter around as well. I had to be extra careful to not get anything prickly caught on me and poke my skin, as I tried to make my way through all this mess. It was really icky. Inside of the old school was obviously no better. There was tons of trash and old equipment strewn throughout the place. I almost didn't understand why people liked to scope out these places, because they were always so dirty and bad. I do have to admit they can be creepy and somewhat spooky, though. Ted, on the other hand, was clearly having the time of his life. He was talking about how cool everything was. He was thinking about the kinds of students who used to walk down these hallways all the time. Now it was just an empty, deserted, and dead place. He was so fascinated by that. Ted wanted to go search the basement of the building, which I really, really did not want to do. But as you might have figured out by now, this was his adventure this time, not mine. I decided to follow him down there. It was much darker than I'd expected, but he'd brought a flashlight along to make up for that. It didn't keep it from being really weird, though, just being there, thinking about all the times people had walked these halls over and over again, only for it to be silent and empty now. Once we arrived in the basement, though, we heard this loud thumping noise. If it had been going on before, we certainly hadn't heard it from upstairs, but this noise had been so loud we definitely would have. It seemed to be coming from the far room on the left side of the hallway. Ted, being like he was, wanted to find out what was making this noise right away. I was already nervous and unhappy about this situation. I tried to convince him not to mess with it, but then we heard the thumping noise continuing. By this time, he was way too curious to leave without taking a peek. As we went down the dark hallway, we heard the noise continue. I got more and more nervous the closer we got to that room. Whatever was going on in there, I really did not want to know. If I wasn't sure Ted would relentlessly mock me about this later, I would have just taken off without him. However, I did the best I could to keep my distance behind him. He was the overzealous one here, so he should be taking the risk over me. When we got closer to the door, he peeked inside. I had never seen the look on his face anything like I saw that day. It changed so fast. He turned whiter than I had ever seen him, and a look of terror covered his face. He stood there for a moment, seemingly unable to look away from whatever was on the inside of that door. I still didn't want to look, and I made no motion to go anywhere closer than I already was. It only took a moment for Ted to decide he'd seen enough now. He turned to me and whispered, Let's get out of here now! We began running down the hallway. Ironically, he was trying to be quiet, but his footfalls were making tons of noise down the hallway tiles. I followed him. When we got to the door to the staircase, I heard something coming from behind us. I turned around and looked back in the direction of the thumping noise. What I saw was that someone had opened the door, and their huge hulking figure was stepping out of the room. That's all I saw, though. I wanted to get out of there before whatever scared my braver friend saw me, too. We ran back up to the first floor and got out of that building as quickly as we could. The only part that really sucks about this is that Ted absolutely refused to tell me what he'd saw. At first, I had assumed he did this because he was trying to scare me, 
you know, maybe there was nothing in the room to begin with, but I know I saw the door open, and I saw the guy too. Even though I didn't get a good look at them, I know someone was there. So there must have been something truly horrifying inside that room. Something enough to scare a friend of mine who is extremely brave. I wonder what those large thumping noises were in the bottom of that abandoned school building. And that's all I really know about it, and probably all I ever will. I recall seeing the total transformation of a mall when I was younger. When I was a kid, and even into my mid-teens, the major mall, which has long since been torn down, was actually pretty active. It had the only movie theater in the whole area, and was an extremely popular hangout for teenagers. When I was 15, though, an outlet mall opened up that wasn't very far from this mall. This brought a rather quick decline to the major mall. For a while, the mall hung on, because it still had the only theater in the area, but a few regal cinemas soon began opening up, and at that point, it was curtains. The only thing really left there was a ticket master. It didn't take long before that went under as well. Eventually, the mall became nothing more than a shadow of what it had been before. I honestly don't know a lot about what it went through from its closing until its eventual demolition. I knew that one of the reasons it was eventually going to be demolished was the worry it would become a haven for gang activity. I don't really know if that happened or not, though. All I can tell you that happened during this time period is what happened when I decided to check it out myself. It was a pretty stupid thing to do, honestly. Even though I had a job, I spent a little bit of time being homeless. I was sleeping in my car to save up some money to eventually get a place to live. It wasn't actually as bad as some people might think it was, however. I had blankets and pillows. It was very comfortable. The only thing that really bothered me was having something to do, and I really had to often search for that. This brings us to the mall. I had heard from someone at work that they were still trying to figure out what they wanted to do with the massive building. I got to thinking... It might be somewhat interesting to go and check it out on my day off from work. Well, technically my night off from work. There were some pretty busy roads in that area, and if I didn't want to get caught snooping around, I had to go at night. I made sure it was pretty late outside when I did finally go to check the place out. I parked in a motel parking lot close by, and then walked the distance to the mall. Walking around such a large and empty space was really weird at first. You know, now that I think of it, I'd never actually been in a parking lot before where it was completely empty. At first, I was just walking around the building. I had no intention of breaking into it or anything like that. However, at one point, I noticed one of the doors looked like it had a broken latch on it. I decided to check and see if I could get it open. It opened much easier than I thought it would, and now I was not sure what I wanted to do next. I thought for a moment, and decided to go inside and check it out. Now this was truly a surreal experience. It was such a big and bustling area back in the day, and now it was just deserted. Empty of people and fixtures as well. All of the stores had those big metal grating doors pulled down. When I shined my flashlight into them, I could still see merchandise and fixtures inside and things like that. There, of course, was not any people inside, though. I decided to try and go up one of the escalators. It was turned off, of course, so I used it as a normal staircase instead. It was actually pretty solid. There wasn't a whole lot different looking on the top floor than the second floor. Although they did have an old Auntie Anne's, which gave me a craving for a pretzel... I walked by a bookstore and was looking at the bookshelves inside. I was moving the flashlight around trying to get a better look. When I moved it toward the back of the store though, I was caught by surprise when the light fell upon a man standing in the back, already staring at me from the darkness. I jumped from being startled, but didn't move the light. This guy clearly was not a security guard or anything like that. 
He was dressed in plain clothes. After looking further for a moment, I realized he had a gun in his hand, which he was holding down at his side. It only took the slightest movement of his arm raising up for me to realize I needed to get out of there now. And I did so. I ran back the way I came and jumped down that escalator. When I got to the bottom, I looked up and saw the man standing at the top, now joined by someone else. He hadn't fired the gun at me or anything, thank God. I hoped he was just trying to scare me away from the area. I don't believe he actually followed me down the stairs. I hurried toward the door I had gained entry from and got out. I kept expecting something to happen behind me, so I kept checking, but nothing did. While I hurried across the parking lot, I kept looking back to see if anyone was following me. Keep in mind this was a big parking lot, so I got a lot of chances to glance backward. At one point, I noticed the two men had emerged from the building, but they weren't trying very hard to chase me across the parking lot. I got to my car and got out of that place. There was an apartment building I had been using the parking lot in, and I didn't feel safe until I got back there. I knew there was no way the men could have followed me, but I still felt on edge about the whole thing. I learned my lesson that day about going into places where I don't belong. If the man had been anyone different, he might truly have shot me. Perhaps I had stumbled upon something illegal going on, and if I did, I think the way he and his friend chased me out was their best way of trying to scare me into never coming back. I can say that it worked very well. I've done a lot of hiking and exploring in my time, and one of my favorite things to do when I'm out in the woods is to find something left over from back in the days. What I mean is that I often come across old farm-type equipment, perhaps an old well or an old mine, sometimes even really old buildings. I often wondered about these buildings more than anything else. You could find houses, sheds, and all kinds of structures like that in the strangest of places. When I was still living at home, I decided to go out on a hike once. That ended up being what was probably the scariest experience of my entire life. I think I was 16 years old at the time. My family lived in an area that had a lot of woods around it to explore. I had spent more time than I can even recall walking around the area, exploring and finding new things. So by the time I was 16, I thought I couldn't be surprised by anything. On this day, however, I was absolutely surprised by what I found. At first, I couldn't quite tell what I was looking at, but I noticed a lot of unusual growth in a particular spot. I thought I should make my way over to it and explore. It looked like there was some sort of opening in the side of the hill. Curious, I began beating back some of the overgrowth to get a better look. At first, I thought what I had found was a cave. Pretty neat, but not extremely unusual for the area I was in. The more I checked it out, though, the more I realized I had, in fact, found an abandoned mine. I had never seen anything like this one before, and I was immediately intrigued. Honestly, no thoughts went through my head about the possible dangers of exploring this abandoned mine. I just knew immediately I had to check it out. I had to spend some time clearing the brush out of the way so I could fully get inside though. The only light I had on me was from my wristwatch and that wasn't exactly going to do a whole lot of good. I needed the light outside coming in to see. I cautiously stepped into the mine after I'd cleared out the growth. I wish I could explain the smell. It was an interesting odor that I'd never encountered before. As you might expect, the area was very dark and very dank. The light from the entrance was enough to allow me to see where I was going, but not by very much. Although it was intriguing, there was not very much to see at first. There wasn't any old equipment or anything like that. If it hadn't been for the support beams that had been built in, I probably would have just thought this was a completely normal cave. Finally, something did catch my eye, however. There was something up ahead of me, lying on the ground. 
It was covered in dirt or clay, or whatever made up the soil of this mine. It was a clear indentation, so I moved for a better look. When I got close enough, there wasn't really enough good light coming from the entrance to make out what I was seeing. I would have to rely on the small light from my wristwatch to make it out. When I turned the light on it, I immediately recoiled. Although I had been to funerals before, and I'd seen dead bodies in caskets too, I had never truly seen a human skeleton that wasn't in a classroom or a doctor's office. This was the very first time. I looked over the skeleton with the light. It had obviously been there a really long time. Skeletal remains were all that was left of this body. Everything else had decomposed a long time ago, or, I shuddered, been eaten by scavengers. What was the scariest part, though, is that I noticed in the head of this skeleton there was a sizable hole. I immediately thought this person must have been murdered, probably by being shot in the head and left in this mine. When I've told this story before, people have asked me why I didn't check inside the skull to see if there was a bullet. My answer is always, how do you feel about picking up the skull of an old body and checking inside for bullets? That's kind of crazy, right? I knew I wasn't in any immediate danger, but that didn't stop me from being scared. At that point, I just wanted to get out of that mine as quickly as I could. I also didn't want to fall and injure myself, though, so I had to be as careful as possible making it out. The last thing that mine needed was another dead body just inside the entrance. It was eerie as hell, though, walking through the mine to get out. I had this irrational fear that someone or something was inside, and whatever killed this poor guy was going to get me next. I decided to go home immediately. I told my dad about what I had seen and wondered what we should do. In the end, he decided we shouldn't do anything, which I at first found rather shocking. My dad explained to me that Firstly, I was trespassing on someone else's property. I couldn't really argue against that. Furthermore, he told me the body had obviously been there a long time, and there was no need to call attention to it and ruffle the feathers of whoever owned the property. I couldn't get the thought out of my head, though. It bothered me deeply, thinking someone may have been missing for years, and finding this body could bring the family closure. I eventually did call the police and left an anonymous message about what I had found and where exactly I had found it. I was really worried for a while. I would always try and read the newspaper after that before my dad could get to it. I was afraid the body would have been found in the mine, and he would be upset with me for going against his advice. The story, however, never ended up in the newspaper, at least not that I ever saw. I went out again a few months later to go check the same area, I wanted to see if the skeleton had been removed. However, I could never find the entrance to that mine again. A few times after that, I had similar results as well. I never saw the opening, and to this day I have no idea who that skeleton in that old abandoned mine was. Back in the early to mid-2000s, I attended summer camp for a few years. One year, I made friends with a camper in my cabin, named Matthew. He returned the following summer as well, but was in another cabin, and we also became friends with another camper named Patrick. Swimming was basically a pool party where the entire camp would gather before getting ready for dinner. During this time, we would have private conversations, Matthew would tell stories, and because they weren't necessarily appropriate for the camp, we'd try to find some privacy. It's often hard to do that, though, especially when the counselors weren't big on us campers wandering off on our own. One day, the conversation shifted, though, from the typical naughty teenager stuff to Matthew asking us to help him practically kidnap a girl from her cabin and get her to the river. The plan was something similar to burying someone in sand at the beach. Matthew said they were friends and had a fight over something. The girl refused to speak to him, and this was a prank to get some revenge. I was not exactly sure this was just a joke, though. I was trying to decide what to do. Was this really a sick prank he actually planned on going through with, or was this a murder plot or something? 
I seem to recall him mentioning the sick things he planned to do to her once he got her buried in the river as well, but my memory of this time is somewhat fuzzy. As Matthew swam away, I quickly told Patrick this was a bad idea, and he backed out of the plan. I used the layout of the cabin as my excuse not to help him. The back door was locked and never used, and the counselors hung out at the front door, having conversations at the picnic table on the side of the cabin, so it would be impossible to sneak out anyway. I'm not sure how he ended up getting caught in the end, as I can't recall that either. I think Matthew said something weird to the girl and she avoided him even further. When we backed out from helping him, he threatened her directly and she told on him to the counselors. Eventually, they got suspicious and confronted Matthew. He melted down and confirmed he was telling us all these things. He then asked them to say goodbye to me and Patrick. The counselors that day pulled us out from dinner. I remember him telling us he was not a pervert or a peeping Tom. He just made it all up. Then he started telling us about all these arguments at home. At breakfast the next day, I asked Patrick what the deal was about Matthew. His family apparently came and got him, driving from out of state to do so. I never saw Matthew again, as he wasn't allowed back after that. I continued hanging out with Patrick until we went home in the end. I'm not sure what to really think about Matthew. I hope he's healthy now with no sick, twisted fantasies. Was he just making up stories like any other kid and going way too far? Or was he really going to do all those terrible things to that girl? I'm not really sure. The moral of the story, though, is that it's one thing to tell ghost stories around the campfire or pull a funny prank on fellow campers, like dressing up as Jason Voorhees. But if someone sounds like they're going to go too far, use your better judgment. You never know what their real intentions might be. The worst thing that ever happened to me happened at a hotel. I was making a cross-country drive. I won't say where exactly to, because I don't really think that's important to the story. All I can really tell you is that it was on a long and lonely cross-country highway. I had been driving quite a long time and late into the night as well. There weren't many cars on the road now, and the ones that were wouldn't turn off their high beams. It was a very lonely and tired experience. Each passing light hit my eyes in a rhythm, almost like a hypnotist, making me feel like I was in some sort of long and painful dream. I'm one of those people who likes driving at night because I make better time, but I was having way too difficult a problem with it this night. I eventually gave in and went to a motel. It was a bit of a run-down one. I didn't even like it at first, but who knows how much longer I would have been able to drive before I found another one. It was almost more like a movie theater ticket booth than a motel office. There was this glass booth, and I had to pass my credit card and ID underneath the glass. It was extremely weird. The man at the counter was kind of strange, too. He kept giving me this weird look, and I could have sworn he was checking me out or something. I felt really dirty. When I finally got my key and went to the room, whatever dirt I felt, I definitely washed away right away. The room itself wasn't exactly dirty, don't get me wrong but it did have this really weird smell. I checked the bed sheets and they seemed to be clean, which made me happy. The carpet was very old though. While it may have been vacuumed, I don't think that would get everything out, so I figured that must have been where the smell was coming from. The bathroom was relatively clean too to my surprise, but something about the water smelled. At that point, I decided I was going to skip the shower instead. I got changed and got ready for bed. I thought I'd check out an hour or so of television and try to fall asleep after that. Yeah, I had been falling asleep on the road, but I always liked to watch something on TV before going to bed in a new place. I was just about to fall asleep while watching TV. When I suddenly heard a knock at the door, I made my way over to the door, stumbling because I was tired. When I looked out through the peephole, I saw a rather large and nasty looking man outside. He had to be six foot five, and I couldn't even hazard a guess as to his weight. 
He was visibly dirty. I can't even describe how gross he looked. I wasn't about to open the door for this guy. I did ask through the door though if I could help him somehow. Uh, yeah, the manager told me I needed to come and get you and take you to the desk. He told me there was a problem with your credit card or something. It was very fishy. This was a motel. The manager should have just called me. I asked the guy why he hadn't done so. Apparently, the main phone of the desk was broken. He informed me that I had to come out to the desk right now because there was a big problem. I wasn't going to go outside, though. I told the man to wait for a minute. I went over to my own portable computer, which I had connected to the motel internet. I pulled up the website for my credit card. When I did, it confirmed the money had properly gone through. I was about to check something else when the man began pounding on the door. Sir, if you don't come out right now, I'm going to have to call the police. The man yelled at me. You'll be arrested for trespassing since you didn't pay for this room. Well, if this guy was planning on attacking me or killing me or something, he really made a mistake getting so aggressive. I surely wasn't about to come out now, and his reasoning was pretty damn stupid. I went over to the door and made sure it was locked up tight. I yelled at the man to go away because I was calling the cops myself now. His response was shocking. You called the police? He yelled back, surprised and incredulous. You really called the police? Sure, call those damn police then. All they're gonna do is arrest your ass. You're trespassing. You wanna go to jail? The only way you ain't is if you come out that door right now. I went ahead and called the police, while the man was still furiously pounding on the door. Apparently, they were already on their way, as the motel attendant and one of my neighbors had heard the ruckus and called them right away. I was going back to the door and told the guy the cops had already been called. We'd see who got arrested in the end. He didn't waste any time, though. He ran off and jumped into the back of a pickup truck, which then took off right away. When the police arrived, we gave them the full story. They found the guy and arrested him. Apparently, he was an ex-con and had served time for aggravated assault and attempted murder. I found out much later during the case, he had also been wanted and charged with murdering a motel guest in a neighboring state. He'd pretended to be a motel worker and demanded a woman come out of her room because her credit card didn't go through. She went with him and he beat her badly. She died afterward. He was found guilty in our court and was taken to the other state. He was also prosecuted there and got a life sentence. I was going into the city for work. My company was sending me in for some training, and I was pretty excited. They were sending me to one of those high-rise hotels. I had never been in one of them before, so essentially, it was an all-expenses-paid vacation to me. I had money for food and a little for entertainment as well. I was really, really excited that my hotel room was on a really high floor, too. I had always wanted to be in one of those high floors of a building. When I got into the hotel, I was pretty impressed with the money that my company must have spent to get me there. I checked in and went to the elevator and came all the way to the 50th floor. I went into my room and immediately went to look out the window. I looked out onto the city. It was Las Vegas, by the way. Anyhow, I decided to go out and spend my first night hitting the casinos. I went out of my room and got on the elevator. When I did, there was only one other person in it. I guess I should feel bad about labeling this person immediately, but he seemed really filthy. I almost thought he was homeless at a first glance. He definitely didn't appear to be the type of person who could stay in such a nice hotel. Several times, this guy tried to start up a conversation with me. I was polite to him and gave him yes or no answers to most of them. He asked me if I was going anyplace in particular, and I told him I was going out to the casinos for the night. When he asked if I needed someone to help show me around, I gave him a surefire no. The guy immediately stopped talking, but even though we were the only two people in the elevator, he began slowly moving closer and closer to me. I tried to ignore him, you know, pretend he wasn't there, 
but it didn't stop him from continuing to move in. Soon he was so close to me, I could practically feel his breath. I was dying, hoping this long elevator ride would finally end. It seemed it still had a while to go yet, though. Thankfully, just when I was about to lose my cool and snap at this guy or something, the elevator stopped at a floor. The guy quickly shuffled away from me, verifying he was surely a creep. Thankfully, the couple that got on stayed on the elevator, all the way to the bottom floor. No one else got on the entire time. When we got to the lobby, he followed me out the door and turned to walk the same way I did. I began walking faster, trying to get a head start on him. I was able to lose him in the crowded streets of Las Vegas. I felt a wave of relief wash over me when I did so. More than once when I was out enjoying myself, though, I saw the man appear in the same casino I was. I wasn't sure he had seen me. I wasn't sure he had seen me, and I wasn't sure how he was showing up at the same places each time. I would just try to lay low, and even go to different casinos to lose him again. I wanted nothing to do with this guy. When I'd had enough of the casino browsing, I decided to go back to my hotel room and get some sleep. I kept a watchful eye around me, and was happy I hadn't seen the guy even once on my way back. Happy, that is, until I got back to the hotel, only to see him already waiting in the lobby, seated on a couch right next to the elevators. He looked up when I approached the elevator, and his eyes lit up like he was excited. I went to push the button, just checking to see how he would react. He got up instantly. It was obvious he was waiting to get back on the elevator with me. I figured he must have been following me around until he realized it made more sense to wait in the place he knew I had to go back to, the hotel lobby. Well, there was no way I was going to get into the elevator again with this creep alone. I went immediately away from the elevator and over to the lobby and complained to the desk clerk. I asked for an escort to my room. They not only got me a security guard to escort me, the guard also had a talk with the creep. He told him he was making me feel uncomfortable, and it would be better if he left me alone. He then made the man wait while he went in the elevator with me. I was there for a few days, and I did see the man again often, but he never tried to ride the elevator with me again, and he never tried to talk to me or anything. As a note, I tend to take way too many long drives. One of the reasons is that I really don't like staying in motels. I don't care how clean it is. In my mind, it's nearly impossible for a motel to be cleanly. That's no matter how they decide to take care of it. I don't know, sleeping in the same beds and sheets that tons of people would have used, the same toilets and showers that I would be using as well, I just can't deal with that sort of thing, so I try to avoid staying out altogether. I was driving home from college to visit my parents. Normally, the drive is 14 hours straight through. I basically have to get going right out of bed, and I only have an hour or so to visit with them on arrival, before going to bed once again. On this particular trip the story happens on, though, I ran into a few things that halted my progress. First thing is I got a bit of a late start because we had a power outage in my dorm and my alarm clock didn't go off because of this. I figured I could still make it, but I had never driven at that time. I had to go through a major city. I hit it right at the peak of traffic. My car was slowed to a complete stop at times. I had never experienced traffic so horrible and before I knew it I had lost three extra hours bringing the grand total of time I was behind to five hours. I tried my best to make it up by driving fast and taking less bathroom breaks, but the time I was able to make up was minimal. I called my parents and let them know I was going to be showing up late. However, when my eyes began shutting on their own, I realized it would be too dangerous to keep driving. Caffeine was doing nothing for me. So I called my parents up again and let them know I couldn't get there until the following day. I was going to have to check into a motel. I tried looking for a chain motel, 
I figured at least those might be cleaner for some reason. However, I wasn't able to find one. Before it got too dangerous for me to drive any further, I picked the next one I was able to find. As I pulled up, I didn't exactly get a good impression from the place right away. I walked into the office only to find no one there. I rang the bell at the front desk and heard some noise coming from a room in the back. A man in his 40s came out from the room back there. I could tell he had been sleeping in the office. He kept looking at me in a way that made me very uncomfortable. He kept his face down toward the desk, but his eyes were looking straight up at me. He did this nearly the entire time I was checking in. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I finally got the key to my room and was able to go inside. For a motel that wasn't in a chain, the place was actually fairly large. I had to drive around to get to my room and parked right in front of it. I felt a little bit better about the experience once I got inside. It was about as clean as you could expect a room like this to be. Still, I couldn't bring myself to shower there. I hadn't brought my shower shoes that I usually used in the dorm. After I got ready for bed, I turned out the light and went to sleep. I was actually surprised how easily I fell asleep that night. I woke up a bit later, not exactly sure as to what had woken me up. I'm not one of those people who normally wakes up during the night. I tend to sleep like a log straight through. I assumed it was some sort of noise and waited to see if I would hear it again. I decided to just lay back down after a while. I slept for what seemed like a long time, but I was awoken once more. I noticed it had only been half an hour. Again, I wasn't sure what exactly had woken me up. There must have been something making some noise, but again, there were no noises when I tried to listen. I laid back down and this time stayed awake for a bit. It wasn't as easy to go back to sleep. I had been woken up twice already and was now unnerved. I'd had my eyes closed for a while. When I felt something, it wasn't much at first. It felt like a movement on the bed. I figured it was nothing until I slowly began feeling something pressing down on the left corner of the bed frame. It felt as if a person were putting distinct pressure right there. I opened my eyes and got up this time. I turned on the lamp, only to see the man. The one who had checked me into the motel earlier was in the room with me. He didn't have a weapon or anything, but he was at the corner of the bed, staring at me. He had been trying to get into bed with me. That was when I realized he must have been what had woken me up the previous two times. It must have been because he was trying to get onto the bed quietly. I was horrified further by realizing the man must have been in the room the entire time while I had been sleeping. I'm not really that big of a guy, but I am in decent shape, and I was angry. I jumped out of the bed and grabbed the lamp off the table, threatening to beat the guy's ass. He seemed unsure of what to do and finally decided to flee from the room. I quickly used the phone to call the cops. The cops told me the guy had just gone back to the desk. Apparently, he'd also called the cops, saying he had an unruly guest that he needed thrown out. Turns out the guy had a previous record of doing some unsavory things, however, so the police believed me right away and arrested him. Eventually, I was allowed to go on my way. I went straight home, and I've never slept in a hotel ever again. This happened over 10 years ago, so excuse me if the details are a little bit fuzzy. When I was in high school, my friend Claire came to sleep over. We had made some plans to sneak out and hang out with some guys. Then one of them would drive us home after. We go out to our friend's apartment, have some fun, when around midnight we decide it's time for us to head back. When we asked to be taken back though, everyone said no despite previously agreeing to do so. Everyone had gotten too drunk or too high to drive, so we eventually had to just start walking back. We would make some phone calls to see if anyone could pick us up and bring us the rest of the way there. My house was a good 20 minutes away by car on the highway, so there was no way we were walking all the way back together. 
The friend's apartment was toward the back of the complex, so we started making our way to the entrance area. We hadn't even gotten halfway there before a car started rolling up behind us. I was 15 or 16 at the time and very naive of the ways of the world. I wasn't too concerned right then, but Claire was a little smarter than me on this night. She told me we needed to start walking faster, so we did so. The car picked up pace right behind us. Again, she told me we really needed to start moving, so we started going as fast as we could. That's when the car pulled slightly in front of us, and two passenger doors opened up. Two men jumped out. Realizing there was no walking faster to get out of this situation, she instructed me to run right now. She took off running and I followed behind her. She ran towards a group of parked cars and jumped behind a pickup truck. For a minute, we hoped and prayed we hadn't been spotted. This is where the details get kind of fuzzy. One of them must have gotten back in the car at some point, as there was now only one of them following us behind the truck. We heard a set of footsteps quickly approaching, and she indicated we now had to go into stealth mode. The man was on the other side of the car we were hiding behind, circling the truck and looking for us. We were slowly and quietly circling on the opposite side to avoid being spotted. It was almost like a scene from a video game. We somehow managed to do two or three circles around the vehicle without being detected, and by the grace of the gods he gave up and went back to the car with his friends inside. This was our one shot to get away. She told me to run again, so we ran for what felt like an eternity. In reality, it was probably only 15 seconds though. We found the pool house area and found a spot to hide. We were hidden behind some fences and bushes, anxiously waiting to see if they discovered us. Their car pulls around to the pool house, and we're biting our nails hoping they don't stop and get out. The car slowly drove away though, and we realized we hadn't yet been spotted. We were safe for now. The car circled around the apartment complex though, for hours and hours and hours. They were not giving up on looking for us. We were safe staying where we were for the time being, but we needed to find a way to get out of there. It was the middle of winter, and of course we were dressed to impress the guys we went to hang out with, so short shorts and revealing tops. We were absolutely freezing. Claire found a dirty, disgusting Captain America blanket that we huddled up under together while making phone calls to find anyone to pick us up. We tried contacting the guys at the apartment, but no one answered our calls. None of our other friends answered either. We felt completely alone and hopeless. Finally, around 5 a.m., someone answered and said they would come pick us up. The best news I had ever heard in my life. Our friend got to the apartment complex, but couldn't find the area we were hiding in. The group of men were also still constantly circling around, so there was no way we were coming out of hiding. We managed to figure out where our friend was at with a little deductive work, figuring out what building they were facing, what was in front of them, and what landmarks were nearby. We figured out where they were, and we had to make a run for it. We spotted their car and ran as fast as we could. We told them to speed off right now, and our friend took off toward the entrance. We passed the group of men on the way out as they stared behind us, and that was the last we saw of them. We made it back around 6 a.m., just in time to sneak back in without my parents ever knowing we had left. If Claire hadn't been with me that night, I definitely would have been abducted, possibly killed, or even worse. So thankfully, Claire and our friend really had our backs that night. But fuck you to the adult men we went to hang out with as teenagers. Especially fuck you to the guys who intended to harm us that night. On a happier note though, I'm now very diligent and aware of my surroundings. We washed the dirty blanket and shared custody of it for years after this encounter. I first got on the internet in the late 1990s. I was pretty naive at the time, as I assume many of us were. I was so overwhelmed by the amount of people I met and the supposed friends that I made. I was 16 years old, and I was really at odds with my parents at the time. 
That was when I began talking to a girl who lived in California, though we never had any sort of romantic talking. We became what I believed were really good friends. I told her a lot about what was going on in my life, and a couple of weeks after we'd begun talking, she told me that if I ever needed a place to live, I could come and stay with her. Well, I took her completely seriously, so I decided to just up and leave in the middle of the night one night and take the Greyhound all the way to California. I didn't have much money, but there was enough to get me to where I was going. After the nearly four-day trip across the country, when I got to the station, she was nowhere to be seen. I tried calling her and there was no answer either. I thought maybe she was just on her way to pick me up, but I waited and I called and I waited and called again. I soon came to the realization she was never going to come and get me. Because I believed someone that I didn't know, I ended up in a city that I knew nothing about, with no money, family, or friends. I wasn't sure what to do. It's not like I could just call my parents. I know a lot of you probably think that I could, but they would have told me that I made the mess and I would have to find my own way out of it. I spent as much time as I could in the bus station, but my time soon ran out when I was asked by a security guard to show my bus ticket. Of course, I didn't have one, so I was forced to leave soon after. I had to wander around LA on my own. I think most people would be surprised at the things you would do when you have no money and no way to get food or shelter. Your qualms about taking food out of the garbage go away very quickly, as do your cares about breaking into abandoned buildings in order to find a place to sleep. Yeah, I was naive and somewhat stupid for going to California in the first place but I also found myself to be extremely trusting of other people that I didn't know. After about a week of sleeping on the streets trying to find some sort of runaway shelter and failing, I was sleeping in an alleyway. Something suddenly woke me up. It moved my leg a little bit. I was briefly aware of the sensation, but then I felt it again. This was definitely someone kicking me lightly on the side of the leg. When I woke up, there was a rather large man standing right next to me. Startled, I jumped up and was about to run away when the man stopped me and told me he was not a cop and he wasn't going to hurt me or anything either. He told me that he'd noticed me sleeping in the alley and wondered if he could get me a bite to eat or perhaps give me a place to sleep for just one night. Well, as you can imagine, I was eager for both, so I agreed. He took me to a fast food restaurant and let me order a ton of food. I scarfed it all down while he talked to me about my situation. I don't know how much of it I was actually paying attention to. It just felt so good to be getting some hot food in me. He then loaded me up in his car and told me he'd find me a safe place to sleep for the night. I honestly thought this meant he would be taking me to a motel or something. He didn't though. He took me to a house outside the city. It looked like it was abandoned or something. The lawn was obviously uncared for, and the place was not kept up at all either. I recall the windows being boarded up as well. Still, I didn't think too much about it. I'd slept in many different abandoned buildings over the past week, so having another one was no big deal. The man opened the door, which was not unlocked, and he let me walk first into the building. It was dark, and he made no moves to turn on the light. He walked over to a door and told me I could sleep in that room. I didn't know how to respond, really. I looked into the doorway and saw it wasn't a room at all. In fact, it was a staircase leading downward into the darkness. For the very first time, I paused. When I did so, the jerk grabbed me from behind and shoved me down the stairs. I fell hard all the way down to the bottom. As I did... I heard him close and lock the door behind me. A few moments later, I heard his car start up and he drove away. This was certainly an odd situation. I was homeless, and even though I was locked in a room, at least I was not outside in the cold. I'd also been put in this place against my will, though. I explored the room. There was nothing in there. No food, no water, no bed, no blanket. It was just a completely empty basement with a single window that was too high up on the wall for me to reach it. I decided to sleep 
and just wait it out and see what the guy was planning. He didn't come back right away, though. In fact, I fell asleep and was woken up in the morning by the sun shining down through that window. He didn't come back that day. He didn't come back that night, either. He didn't come back the following day or the following night. At this point, I was beginning to get really scared. Yeah, I was hungry, but the thing I was most worried about was water. I knew I couldn't survive much longer without it. I was going to die of dehydration, which is an agonizing way to die. Another day passed, and I felt myself getting weaker, like I would die at any moment. I had gone almost three full days without any water. I had been told before that three full days was the maximum amount before you couldn't live any longer. I didn't die yet, but I felt so sick and wonky that I couldn't even get up. I was falling in and out of sleep for who knows how long. I was jolted awake after who knows when, once I saw light shining down through the window. Fear gripped me, because I assumed it was that man coming back for me. He'd probably assumed I'd long since died and was coming to take my body away, or whatever it was he did with people he did this to. I tried to get up to my feet. Maybe I could try to trip him or something as he came through the door. However, I couldn't even bring myself to my knees, much less onto my feet. I just lay there weakly, listening as the door was unlocked. I heard footsteps on the upper floor. I had all these thoughts running through my head. Once he noticed I wasn't dead, he would probably just kill me himself. I wanted to be ready for something, but I didn't know what I could do. I'm not sure how long I heard walking around with the door opened. When a light shined down on me, I heard a woman's voice saying something, but I couldn't tell what it was. I passed out again and woke up next time in the hospital. My throat was extremely dry and there was an IV in my arm. It turned out that the old house was for sale and it was being showed. The agent was the one who opened the door and called the police in an ambulance when they saw me down there. I told the cops about the man, but there was no indication who he was. He was not the owner of the house, and as far as they knew, he never came back either. The police told me they figured he was just some sicko who wanted people to find dead bodies in their basement. I wasn't the first person they'd found in such a predicament. I was lucky that I managed to survive as long as I did. It was mostly because I was a minor. My parents were contacted, and they put me on a plane and brought me home. Interestingly enough, our problems we had seemed very minor once I got back home. I was one of those teenagers that hated just about everything that came from being a teenager. I hated living at home with my parents. I hated having to go to school. I hated trying to live under anyone's rules. When I was 16, I didn't exactly drop out of high school. However, I did just quit going altogether. It wasn't interesting to me anymore. When my parents got contacted about it, they told me I had to go to school. We got into a huge fight, and they told me that if I didn't go to school, then I couldn't live there anymore. I knew it was a bluff, but I really didn't care. I was fed up with living there anyway, so I contacted a few of my best friends. They were people who also hated living at home. My friend Carl had a car, and we decided to take what we had, load up the car, and go live our lives away from our families. We started driving west. We figured we'd drive through some of the mountain states, then head to California. It seemed like the best place for a runaway from home to go. We had at least a little bit of money. It was enough to keep us up with gas and keep us fed for a while. I was the first one to run out, though I didn't really ration it nearly as well as I should have. When you spend a lot of time with people in the car, especially if you've never been with them for a long, long time before, it can get somewhat testy. As well, I think the fact I didn't have any money made everyone sort of pissed off at me. While we were driving through the mountains in Colorado, we stopped to take a bathroom break. When I was done and zipping up, I heard the car start up. As I tried to run back to the area, I saw them all pulling away without me. I yelled, demanding for them to come back. One of the guys flipped me the bird as they drove off and left me behind. 
Now I really had no idea what to do, so I just walked along the side of the road. We were way up high in the mountains, and the altitude was already making me sick. A few cars went by me, and I tried hitching from them, but I guess most people don't want to pick up a lonely guy on the roadside. I had been hitching for several hours, and it was very dark now. Of course, when it got dark, the temperature fell accordingly, and I began to fear for my life. Finally, after hours and hours passed by, a car stopped to pick me up. I eagerly jumped in the passenger seat. The man who picked me up seemed pretty normal at first. He was a bigger guy, really fit. He looked like he worked out quite a lot. He was driving a luxury car with seat warmers, so I figured he must be decently well off too. He seemed really interested in helping me. It was after we had some normal small talk that he began asking me some more about myself. You know, why I was outside hiking in the mountains. I told him my friends had abandoned me when I ran out of money. I also told him I was 18 years old. I think he knew I was lying, though. I barely even looked the 16 years I was. He got very interested in my story, why I had left with my friends to begin with. I was so thankful to have him pick me up, I just kept on answering all his questions without thinking. I didn't even harbor a thought he might have an ulterior motive. I slipped up and told him I'd left home because my parents and I weren't getting along. I don't think I was quite catching on that he was fishing for information. I just admitted I was a teenage runaway. Furthermore, a teenage runaway that no one knew where they were and might not possibly even care about. Then the conversation got much darker. The guy began telling me a story about the last time he'd picked up a hitchhiker. He made it seem like it was something he had done often. Told me it was another underage kid, making me realize he knew I was lying. I asked him what happened to the kid, and his response scared the crap out of me. Well, only I'll ever know. I tried to keep my fear hidden. I had so recently been grateful I'd been given a ride, but now I was terrified. I was trying to steer the talk back to this other hitchhiker, but he kept fishing around for more information about my home life. I was convinced I was going to end up a story this guy would tell another hitchhiker one day. I tried not to make it seem like I was afraid of him in any way. I asked him if we could stop at a rest area or something, because I badly had to go to the bathroom. He was unwilling to stop, so I began making my legs jump up a bit and pretended I needed to piss. He told me we'd stop at a gas station in about 15 minutes. When he brought the car to a stop, I told him I'd be back soon and ran out into the store. I immediately let the cashier know what was going on. I pointed to the car out by the pump. The man saw me talking to the clerk, and at that point he immediately pulled away and took off down the road at blazing speeds. That in my mind just confirmed what I already believed. I was done with my adventure now. I asked the clerk if I could use the phone, and I called my parents who were worried about me. They wired me the money to get home. Turns out I was actually the lucky one. My friends, when they were out of money, held up a gas station and got in much more trouble than I did. Funny how that works out in the end. Every now and then, you have to look back and wonder about things in your life. How it may have gone differently if we knew the results our actions would have. Everything might be so much better, choosing what actions would make the best outcomes, but instead everyone makes mistakes, and everyone suffers the consequences of those mistakes. I grew up in a fairly uncomfortable environment. My parents got divorced when I was really young. Us kids ended up being with our dad, not because he was a good parent or anything, but because he was the only one with a job and a place to live. He was quite substandard as a parent, actually. He got very lost in the alcohol. It was abuse, and he was bad at paying his bills as well. As a result, we ended up moving quite often. Whenever he'd neglected to pay rent for months on end, we'd have to move every time. We had no stability at all. When I was 15 years old, I met a boy named Todd, who was in a remarkably similar situation to me. Only, for him, it was his mother. She was the worst parent. He lived with his brother, and the few times I was over at his house, 
I saw firsthand just how awful she was. We were both miserable. So one day, when he was taking me for a ride in his Mustang, the song Fast Car by Tracy Chapman came on the radio. I guess we were both so miserable in our lives we decided to do it and just run away right then. We gathered some brief belongings and some money and decided we were going to drive out to Chicago. I guess I could bog you down with the details. Hell, I could write a novel about it if I wanted to. All I can say is the trip was alright and we did make it to Chicago in the end. However, we quickly learned that being able to find a job at 15 and 16 years old was a lot more difficult than it seemed. Also, his car was bought and paid for completely, but being 16 years old, it was not in his name. It was a present from his father, so it wasn't like his mother could report it stolen. The point being, we couldn't get any money for the car in any way. We had a hotel room at a really ratty hotel in the city, and after a few days of us not being able to pay for the room, Todd felt he had to do something in order to get us some money. One day, he went out, and he was gone for a very long time. When he came back, he was visibly exhausted. I tried to get some information out of him, but he wouldn't tell me anything. He always changed the subject while we ate, then watched some television together. This continued for about a week and a half. Todd would go out during the day and come back looking completely worn down. He would always have food, though, and a little bit of money as well, just enough to keep us going. One day, I told Todd we had some money to last us a few days, and he should take a day off from whatever it was he was doing. I'd go out and buy us some food instead. He was hard to convince, but eventually I did convince him to do it. He gave me some cash, and I went on my way. I was out of the hotel room for about three hours. I had to find a grocery store and get there and get the food and come back. I felt really good about myself. I'd finally done something for Todd, who had done the world for me at that point. I came into the motel room, only to drop the groceries on the floor. Todd was laying in the bed. His throat had been cut completely open. His eyes stared blankly into nothingness, and there was blood all over the place. I ran down to call the hotel office and got them to call the police. It was a nightmare. I mean, an absolute nightmare. I couldn't believe what just happened. Just a few hours beforehand, I had been feeling on top of the world, thinking I could let my best friend rest well. I tried to do something nice for him, and in that short period of time, he was brutally murdered in the room I'd slept with him in all along. I was sent back home to my dad. Todd's parents were called soon after. There was an investigation, of course, but the case is cold, and Todd has been left with no trail. As to what sort of job he was doing to get that money, the only person who knew him in the city was me, and I didn't know anything. Todd was a teenage runaway, whose death got lost in the annals of teenage runaways. I always assumed whatever he was doing for money, it must have been something illegal. I wonder if I'd stayed home that night, would he still be alive? But I have a feeling we'd both be dead instead. I feel responsible for my friend being murdered. I don't have any answers to these questions, but I spent my life being an advocate for resources for teens who run away from home. I hope that maybe some teenagers hearing this story will decide against running away. Your life may be miserable now, but it can get a whole lot worse. If you do run away, go to a shelter. Don't do anything illegal. The world's a lot scarier than you think it is. I promise you. I miss you, Todd. That's all I can say to you. That plus, I'm sorry. My SO and I had a big fight, and I decided to leave the party we were at. It was only about 9pm, and I was crying, so I wanted to go home, rather than go with everyone else to the bar crawl. I hailed a cab, got in, and gave him the address. The directions only needed three turns to get home. I then started text arguing on my phone, still crying. I was too engrossed in the argument, though, and realized too late that he had taken a left two streets earlier than he was supposed to. My phone was kind of messed up, so even though it said it still had battery, 
It just suddenly went black and wouldn't turn on anymore. I looked up and noticed we were not on the right track. Hey, wait, where are we? At that point, the guy started speeding like crazy, going towards the highway. I started screaming, but he was not even reacting to me. Before he turned on to the highway, he had to slow down by a light, though. I frantically tried to open my door to bail, only to realize it was child-locked. He ended up going 90 miles per hour down a two-lane road, then turning into a dark alley behind a small, empty office building. He reached back and grabbed me and tried to pull me towards him. This part is a little bit blurry. I remember frantically twisting my body, so much so that he lost his grip and my head was by the passenger side window. I knocked open the door with my head and tumbled out into the gravel and glass. I got up and started running. Only problem was, I was in the middle of nowhere. There were no street lights, no cars to flag down for help. I made a swift judgment call and ran towards the office building. I found a hiding place inside, and I could hear him walking around and yelling. Hey, I'm sorry, I won't try anything. Just come back to the car and I'll drive you home for real, free of charge. There's nothing out here, I promise. You'll be out here all night, just get back in the car. He went back to his car and slowly drove around in a circle, clearly searching for me. When I saw his car pull out and start off down the street again, I waited for a couple more minutes, then ran as fast as I could until I came upon a tiny hole-in-the-wall biker saloon. Obviously, I was bawling my eyes out, saying I needed to go inside and use their phone to call the cops. The bouncer wouldn't let me in because I didn't have my ID. I'd left my purse in the cab, unfortunately. I pled with them, but I guess they didn't believe my story. Two guys parked out front started creepily catcalling me. I freaked and started running again, trying to find someone who would help me. I ended up stumbling upon a closed Walgreens at an intersection. That's when I realized my dead phone was still in my pocket. I tried to turn it back on, and after multiple tries, it finally worked. I called 911 and gave them my location. They said they were on the way, and then the phone went black and dead once again. I waited for about 45 minutes, but no one arrived. Panicking, I tried again. I had to finagle my phone for a long time, but eventually it worked, and I called my SO. No answer. I called his roommate who picked up, and as quickly as I could while choking on tears, told him where I was, and he needed to come get me immediately. He did so, thank God. I got in the car and we called 911 together. And the police said they would meet us at his apartment. After two hours, we called again. They said they would be there in half an hour, but they never came. I went to the station the next morning to report it. And that's not where the story ends, though. A couple days later, I get a call from my apartment complex saying, Hey, we have your purse at the office. Come by and get it. I almost fainted. How? I talked to the office staff who said the people at my old apartment had turned it in for me. We'd recently moved away from that one bedroom to a new two bedroom. I went to my old apartment and knocked on the door. A couple living there said a guy matching the cab driver's description had started banging on their door and yelling late last night. It's not the best area of town, so the husband opened the door with his gun drawn and asked the man what the hell he was doing. He stuttered something about returning my purse. The husband had a bad vibe, though, and made him fork it up with his gun and leave. He drove away in his cab after. The wife wrote down the cab info that she could see from under the street lamp. I can't imagine what would have happened if he still lived there. I'm so glad the couple was well protected. I work as a nanny, and after telling my employer about this, she was horrified. She told me I needed to look at something. She's a lawyer and her firm had been working on compiling a case against that same cab company for hiring multiple people with violent criminal records. A couple of weeks later, with her help and the information from that couple, my attacker was caught. To this day, there's so many what-ifs that terrify me. What if I didn't get away? What if he had just turned around and come back down the street? What if I'd actually changed the address on my license when I properly should have? I'm very thankful everything lined up for me to get away. I'm 28 years old now, 
but this is the first time I've thought about this incident in detail in quite a while because of how traumatizing it was to me. I met my ex-girlfriend in California in 2010. We had both lived there our entire lives, but decided to move to Maine a couple of years after we'd started dating. She had flown to Maine on a business trip in 2012 and fell in love with everything about it. The small towns, the fantastic scenery, and of course, the people. She came home and convinced me to pack up our bags and move there. So, we did so. We saved up a bunch of money and rented a huge moving truck. The plan was for me to drive the truck across the country, while she stayed behind three days to finish up her classes at the local community college, which were due to end around that time. I would have just waited until her classes were already finished, but we decided to take advantage of an incredibly good deal we were offered from the company, who provided the moving truck. She had a car, so she would be able to drive there anyways, while I towed my car behind the moving truck. My brother came with me on the trip. The drive was obviously going to be a very long one. When my brother and I arrived in Maine, about four days after we had left, we were completely exhausted. After unloading the truck and sleeping for about 16 hours, we decided to visit the small town of Belfast, which was about 14 miles away from the new house. We ate some good seafood at a little family-owned joint, rented a scary movie, and made the drive back. My new house was literally right in the middle of nowhere. During the day, the view of the lake in my backyard was amazing. The woods surrounding my house were awesome, and everything was completely beautiful. At night, the house was incredibly creepy to be in, though. The whole house had windows completely surrounding it, so you could not see anything looking outside. I'm sure if you were standing outside of them, you could quite easily see in, though. My brother had a flight booked back to California the following day. We woke up very early in the morning to drive down to Portland where the airport was. I eventually made it back alone and wasn't able to make any phone calls or watch any cable TV because we had no service out there and no cable or internet hooked up yet. My cell phone didn't work anywhere on that property. I had plenty of DVDs to watch, but that was about it. When I made it back, I decided to try out my new fishing pole we had just bought in town instead. I wasn't out at the lake very long, as it started to get dark in Maine fairly quickly in autumn. I went back to the house and sat down in the living room. I was in a chair looking out the windows at the scenery. The view was getting darker and darker as I turned on all the lights in the house. I quickly became creeped out at just how pitch black it became outside. Imagine being in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, looking around. You couldn't even see your own hand if you held it in front of your face. That's how pitch black it was. You could not see anything. I hadn't hung up any curtains or blinds yet either, and had the extremely uneasy feeling now that someone was outside my house, watching me. Like they were following me room to room, and if someone were out there, they could very easily do just that. I decided to quickly hang some sheets up all over the windows, using some thumbtacks. I sat on the couch in the living room and put on a comedy movie to try and shake that unnerving feeling I had. It did not work at all. Eventually, I tried to get some sleep instead. I had a lot of work to do the next day already, and my eyelids were quickly becoming sore. I was starting to actually get very tired. I covered myself up with some blankets on the couch and turned off the TV. After a few minutes, my eyes had adjusted and I could see around the living room very slightly. My eyes were very heavy, and I fell asleep soon after. I woke up some time later. I could tell it was still in the middle of the night because of how dark it was. I reached for my bottle of Coke on the ground in front of me and took a big sip. I set it back down and looked around the room. Now, I'm having difficulty putting these next emotions into words that I can accurately convey to you. My heart began to throb immediately when I noticed the figure of a man standing in the corner of the room. He was staring at me. I felt as if I was going to die right there from fright. 
I did nothing and said nothing, not by choice, but because I couldn't. I was completely frozen. The man didn't move. I was able to rethink logically for a moment. I'm not sure the man knew I had seen him or was looking right at him. I did have a blanket over me, which might have shrouded me from view and shadowed me, in which case he wouldn't be able to see my eyes. After about a minute of gut-wrenching fear, I decided I had to do something. This was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. I coughed. Of course, not a real cough. I did it while getting up in an effort to give this person the impression I didn't know they were there. I slowly made my way to my feet and walked across the icy cold wood flooring to the bathroom, around the corner of the living room. The figure did not move. I made it to the bathroom, and nothing happened still. I closed the bathroom door and slowly turned the lock to the upright position. Tears went down my face as I backed into the bathtub behind me. I was staring at the door. I suddenly realized there was a small window above the bathtub that I could most likely crawl out through. I moved the shower curtain and reached up to the window. I unlocked it and tried sliding it to the left to open it. The window began to squeak when I pulled it, and I froze, hoping the man hadn't just heard that. Unfortunately, I then began to hear a tapping on the bathroom door. Not a knock, but a gentle tapping. It didn't sound like the tap of fingers either. It sounded like metal. Like they were tapping a knife against the door. At this point, I made the realization that the man either knew what I was doing, or simply wanted me to know he was outside the door now. Adrenaline took over completely, and I slid the window open, pushed the screen out onto the ground, and tried not to make any noise as I jumped up and began squeezing through the window. My head and upper body were out, and I could not see inside the bathroom, only the dense dark woods in front of me. I was just pulling my legs out through the window when I felt something grab my foot. Directly after that, before I could even react, I felt my ankle suddenly sliced open. I let out a noise of shock and surprise as I pulled out of his grasp and fell to the ground. I started heaving, and it felt as if my heart would explode. I stood up and looked around. I quickly dashed out into the woods and fell to the ground, looking back at the house and the window to the bathroom. I felt the area of my leg on my ankle, which was throbbing from pain now. I brought my hand up only to reveal it was covered in blood. The deathly serious situation I was in became real and horrifying. I looked back at the house and saw the back door fly open. The man started gazing around in the darkness surrounding me, clearly searching for me. I became as still as a statue on the ground and tried to control my breathing. He had a big knife in his right hand and was wearing all black. He walked down the patio steps and started walking out into the woods, nowhere near where I was laying, fortunately. He was grunting, and soon after I lost sight of him. I started frantically looking around, worrying that he would spot me at any moment and stab me to death. I saw nothing but trees and darkness. There was a bit of snow on the ground from a couple of days before. I was freezing and shaking at this point. About ten minutes later, I saw the man walk out of the trees from where he had entered and go back into the house. I laid out there for the rest of the night. Luckily, the sun started to rise only about an hour later. After the sun fully illuminated my surroundings, I felt as though the man had probably left and I felt ready to move again. I rose to my feet and walked around the house to the front. I saw the front door was now open completely. I approached it and peered inside. Nothing. I walked in a few steps and gently grabbed my car keys that were hanging on a hook by the door. I ran back to the car and unlocked it. I got inside and started the engine and backed out of the long driveway. I drove to the little general store a few miles from my house. This is where the story ends. I got away and so did my visitor. My ankle was cut up pretty bad but healed just fine after a few months with no problems. I did suffer some minor pneumonia from being outside for a time, but it was nothing too serious. I later found out that not long after, an elderly man that lived about two miles down the road from me was murdered in his bedroom in the middle of the night. This experience took its toll on me and my girlfriend's relationship, and I ended up moving back to California after just a few months. 
The incident made it very difficult to sleep, but writing this has oddly made me feel somewhat drowsy. I think maybe I'll attempt to go to sleep right now. Thanks for listening. This happened to me eight years ago, when I was 30 years old. I had just rented a new house with my family in a very nice neighborhood. We had just moved in about a month before I experienced this. I was in the habit of walking my dog every day at 6 p.m. As soon as I got home from work, I would take her out and we would always walk the exact same route as well. One day, we had just started walking when we passed by a neighbor's home and then witnessed something we did not expect. As we were passing by their driveway, I glanced at the front door, which for some reason was wide open. There was a man talking to two women, but he was crying uncontrollably. I felt very embarrassed, as you can imagine. I walked by and saw one of the two women making eye contact with me. I looked away, but I could still easily hear the man sobbing and cursing. He was clearly very upset about something but I couldn't hear what the two women were saying at all, nor any sound from them whatsoever. Of course, I kept on walking with my dog. Soon after, I forgot all about that incident. Then, a few days later, I got home from work quite late around 8pm or so. As I was turning into my driveway, I saw there were police cars and fire trucks everywhere, as well as an ambulance parked outside of this house. I immediately thought back to the other day and thought for sure it must have been connected to what was going on right now. I pulled into my driveway and went into my home. My wife was cooking dinner and my kid was playing some games. I wanted to walk by and get a better look at what had happened. My wife said she had no idea either. Something was clearly going on here though. I quickly grabbed my dog and went outside for our walk. As we were walking by the house, I saw several people crowded around it. It looked almost like a scene from a movie or a TV show. I stopped for a moment and just watched a man that was walking back to his police cruiser. He spotted me and approached me. He actually questioned me a bit as well. I told him I was just living a few doors down and I was concerned about what was going on. We spoke for a little while and when I actually came to ask him what had happened, he told me something I will never forget. He said that one of the women that lived there had been brutally assaulted and murdered whilst the other one had been left in critical condition in the hospital. The officer clearly saw I was shocked by this news and asked me to quickly be on my way. Before I left though, I made sure to tell him what I had witnessed just a few days earlier. He told me not to worry as they had now detained the man who'd done this he himself had confessed apparently. I resumed the walk in total disbelief. My wife was in equal shock when I told her after I returned home. I later saw on TV a picture of the woman who had been killed. It was undeniably one of the same women who I'd seen that day talking to that man. The news said she had been killed by her ex-boyfriend and that her friend who survived had nearly been beaten to death as well. They eventually showed the man's picture and I felt a bit sick when I saw it was the same guy, crying and sobbing that day. This happened on Halloween night. It happened years ago in Wine County of California. Myself and two roommates lived in a three-bedroom, two-story house. Early in the evening, everything was pretty normal. We passed out candy to trick-or-treaters, hung out together, watched a scary movie, and overall we're having a pretty great time. There's always a certain feeling of creepiness that comes with Halloween night though, especially if you just stay at home. You never really think something sinister or something terrifying will happen after all the candy was gone and all the kids disappeared. Our movie was nearing its end and we had all drunk some wine. We were getting very sleepy around midnight or so, so we decided to call it a night and go to our separate rooms to go to sleep. I slept in the bedroom on the first floor, while my two roommates had the two bedrooms upstairs. 
At about 1 a.m., though, I awoke to some strange noise, accompanied by an ominous feeling. I got out of bed and stood in my dark bedroom, listening for the noise that had initially awoken me. For a moment, I thought maybe there had been no noise at all, and I had simply been having a dream or something, and gotten out of bed for no reason. It took a few moments, but then I heard a muffled scream coming from upstairs. I heard scuffling and commotion coming from up there as well. I was extremely scared at this point, and I decided I had to go see what was happening. In a situation like this, in reality, selfishness often takes over. You really just want to hide or escape and be safe. But still, I opened my bedroom door and took three steps out of my room. The stairs were only a few feet away from my bedroom. Just as I had taken those initial steps, I heard somebody coming down the hall at the top of the stairs. They were coming down fast, and they were coming right towards me too. It was pitch black, and having only a second to decide my next action, I quickly but silently moved to the back sliding glass door and slid it open. While doing this, I felt as if somebody was going to grab me from behind, but none of that happened. I tiptoed backward into the bushes in my backyard while staring at the back door. I expected somebody to walk out at any moment and see me hiding there, but nobody did so. I waited for about three minutes. I'd say I was terrified of what had just happened in the house, what was still happening. I didn't want to go back in. Then though, the faces of my two roommates popped into my mind. I had recalled earlier that night, drinking with them and having fun. I realized if they were in trouble, I needed to be brave and go back inside to help them. I slowly walked back toward the door and crept back inside. I immediately heard screaming. It sounded like it was being muffled by blood. I heard gurgling noises. My heart was beating out of my chest as I climbed the stairs. Unsure if somebody was still in the house or if they had left already, I came to my first roommate's bedroom and turned on the light. A very surreal feeling of this cannot be happening swept over me. I gazed at both of my roommates lying on the bed. One was silent. One was groaning in pain. There was blood all over the room. I didn't know what to do. One of them was making noises, and the other was very clearly already dead. I stepped into the room and almost slipped in the pool of blood that was on the ground. I tried to speak, but nothing would come out. I was in shock. I snatched my roommate's phone off her nightstand and dialed 911. I felt as if the intruder was still in the house and was going to approach me from behind. I kept turning around to check, but saw nothing. I told the operator I needed an ambulance immediately and that my friends were currently dying. Ambulances and police were at my house in only a few moments. My friend that was groaning died before the police even arrived. I never saw the intruder. For some reason, he skipped my bedroom that night and instead went upstairs to murder both of my friends instead. So one night, I got a knock at my door. My boyfriend was at work at the time, and I was not expecting company, especially not so late at night. I turned my music down for a moment, and that's when I realized the door was not locked. Instantly, I was terrified. I'm only 4 foot 10, so I had to prop myself up the wall to look through the peephole and carefully lock the door while doing so. The knocking turned into furious pounding. As I looked outside, the man outside the door was no one that I recognized. He looked quite disgruntled, dirty, and frightening as well. He was short and stocky, and clearly furious. He grew even more frustrated, knowing I had just turned my music down. He must have heard me lock the door. He started calling out to me through it. Ma'am! Excuse me! Ma'am! Only, how the fuck did he know I was a woman? This was a guy I had never seen before, and he hadn't caught a glimpse of me either. I looked around the room, only to see I'd left my blinds open. I realized he must have been watching me vacuum the entire time. Thankfully, at this moment, my neighbors right across from me opened their doors. 
The husband called out to the man. Excuse me, who are you? What are you doing here? Startled, the creep fumbled backwards. Oh, uh, good evening, sir. I was just going to offer my carpet cleaning services to her. Obviously, the husband was very suspicious. Well, that's great and all, but you need to leave right now. The creep ran off right away. Afterwards, I called the police, my boyfriend, and closed up my blinds. I texted the neighbors and thanked them profusely for scaring the man away. I paid extra to live on the top floor, but it seems this creep had been watching me from down below. This happened two years ago on our anniversary. My wife and I were celebrating three years of marriage, and we decided to both take the day off work and go for a drive down to the beach together. And what a drive it was, about three hours one way. The drive was amazing though. We had fantastic conversation and enjoyed various sights along the way. When we arrived there, there was only a few hours of daytime left, but we didn't much mind that. We kind of liked the idea of walking along the sand at night to gaze out among the stars and listen to the ocean peacefully without the usual noise that comes with visiting the beach during the day. We ate dinner at a nice steakhouse right out on the water, and when we finished, we decided it was time to hit the beach finally. From the restaurant, we walked to our car, which was parked in the lot right next to the beach entrance. My wife grabbed her sweater and a blanket, while I grabbed a six-pack and a small cooler we had brought. We headed towards the sand and went through a very old wooden fence with an opening cut out from it. We walked out toward the water and marveled at the sight of it. The moon was lighting our way beautifully. We stopped and chose a nice spot about 30 yards away from the waves crashing against the sand. About 70 yards, I'd say, from the wooden fence leading back to our car. We unfolded the blanket and sat down on top of it. After a few minutes of talking, kissing, and drinking, we laid down together. We were truly amazed by all the stars out in the sky. It was a gorgeous sight. I'd say about 15 minutes later, though, I felt a presence. I was still watching the stars, but I felt like now there was somebody else watching us. I sat up and noticed my wife had already drifted off and fell asleep. I looked around the beach, but I couldn't see anything immediately. It was complete serenity almost. When I turned completely around though, this is when my heart stopped in my chest. About 15 feet away from us, there was a man sitting behind us in the sand. This caught me completely off guard and scared the shit out of me, mainly because he didn't speak when he noticed that I had seen him. Instead, he sat down in the sand closer to us with a giant smile on his face. A giant, extremely creepy smile. I was surprised to see this, and at first I didn't know what to say. I glanced at my wife again, who was fully asleep in that moment. I'm not sure why, but I got the sense our lives were in real danger. I looked up and noticed the man's smile had disappeared and turned into a furious look. He then pulled out a huge knife from underneath him. I shook my wife awake, at the same time calling out the man. What the fuck are you doing? Are you serious? I was scared, but I did the best firm voice I could. My wife regained her focus and spun around to look at the man. At that moment, he smiled again. His giant grin made me shiver. My wife gasped when she saw he had a knife. He didn't say a word and didn't respond either. Instead, he clutched that knife so hard his knuckles looked white and took a step towards us. My wife gasped again. I forced myself to do something. I stood up as well. What do you want? You can have our phones and our keys, but I have no cash, man. The man looked completely insane, though, which was terrifying. He was wearing a brown suit, all ripped up looking. It looked like he'd pulled it out of a trash can or something. His long brown hair was a mess, and he looked almost homeless. Once again, he made no attempt to respond. After 15 seconds of unnerving silence, he finally did something. He began to run up to us very quickly. My wife screamed, and I almost had a heart attack. 
He stopped right before he stepped foot onto our blanket, and once again his smile turned into a crazy, angry-looking frown. I spoke one last time. Dude, you can have everything. Just be cool, man. You can have my beer. My voice was cracking. I was petrified. I tried to humanize myself to this guy and make him feel almost welcome to our stuff, like what he was doing wasn't a big deal. Then he finally spoke in a completely normal, insane voice. I don't drink. Then he turned around and just walked away. Relief hit me like a ton of bricks. I kneeled down and grasped my wife's shoulder. The man continued walking away. At some point, though, he stopped and turned around again. He didn't look at us, though. Instead, he looked up at the sky for a moment, then turned around once more and made his way out through the fence. He disappeared into town. My wife started tearing up and I suggested we go now. We very quickly grabbed our belongings and started walking down the beach toward a different entrance leading to a parking lot next to the one our car was parked in. After circling around the huge parking lot, walking around the restaurant we ate at, we saw people laughing and talking outside. They had no idea the terror we just experienced. We approached our car, got inside, and drove away. We were pretty much silent on the way back home. My wife just hung her head out the window, and we haven't visited the beach ever since. A few months ago, I took in a new dog. Her original owners weren't able to bond with her, and they said she was unresponsive and disobedient, didn't have the look they wanted. I've got no idea what they were talking about. She's the best behaved dog I've ever known, and she's downright adorable as well. I'm used to people stopping me in the street so they can pet her. Usually, people will ask before they touch her, or at the very least, they'll say something. You know, oh my god, look at that dog. They let me know they're obviously going to come over and say hello to her. I'm pretty much fine with that. What I'm not fine with is what happened on one of my earlier walks with her. I live in a tiny seaside town, and I kind of take my dog on a tour of all the areas closest to the sea. When I walk her, I'll walk along the beach, down the promenade, around the miniature lakes, and then home. Probably not smart to stick to the same route every single day, but I've switched things up since this happened. Anyway, we were at the final stage of our walk one evening, making a couple of laps around the lakes, when we walked past a man. Now, a lot of older men like to gather there on a regular basis. I didn't think much of one guy just sitting on a bench by the water. I told myself he was only staring because my dog was so cute. I passed him by, and then from behind me, I heard him say, Sit. My dog did. She was much more obedient than her previous owners had let on. My dog sat down right away, and looked up at me all happy, expecting a treat. I frowned and looked back at the guy. He was still on the bench, just watching us. I quickly encouraged my puppy to start walking again. We hadn't even got five feet further down the path. When the man commanded to my dog again, my dog did exactly what he said. I turned around, already glaring, and saw the man was now up on his feet. I told my dog to keep walking and pick up the pace as well, trying to get over to the path that led up to the main street. We were still nowhere near the path, though, when the man yelled another command. My dog was about to do it, but she was starting to look at me confused. I was pretty terrified, though. The man was now rushing over to us. He was catching up fairly quickly. He was close enough that even without my glasses, I could tell he had this huge grin on his face. At that point, I'd had enough. I forgot about getting to the path and scooped up my dog off the ground in my arms. I ran straight up the hill to the side of us and climbed over the small fence that separated the lakes from the street. The man didn't try to follow over the fence, but instead stayed at the bottom of the hill looking up at us. He was no longer smiling anymore, though. I'd never seen him before in my life, and I haven't seen him visit the lake again since then either. I really hope it stays that way. I don't know exactly what his intentions were that night, 
but it seemed to me he was using my dog's obedience to slow me down and keep me from getting away from him. I doubt they were good intentions, and I'm glad I didn't have to stick around to find out. Hello, I have a story to share with you all. This happened to me about 15 years ago. I lived near the ocean, and I frequented a certain spot on the beach all the time. It was a very lonely spot, and not many people ever showed up there. This one Saturday afternoon, as I recall, I was lying out in the sand in my spot, relaxing and getting a tan on. It's not uncommon for me to fall asleep while doing this, as I sometimes did if the sun was not too hot on my skin. This particular day, I had fallen asleep. I woke up a while later, to the sun now setting. I realized I must have been sleeping for quite a while. When I looked over to my left, I was startled to see a woman sitting right next to me in the sand. Not on a towel or anything. She was wearing jeans shorts and a bathing suit top. She had very striking red hair as well. At first, I didn't even really acknowledge her. There were a couple of other people around further along the beach, but after glancing at her a few times, I noticed she was just kind of staring out into the ocean. She didn't even turn to look at me, or anybody else really. I felt a bit of curiosity and said hello to her. She said hello back without hesitating or even turning her head to look at me. Right after that, she sprung to her feet and walked away. I thought that was all quite weird, but I didn't really think anything else of it. I'd say about 30 minutes later I was packing up my stuff, and I left soon after. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I'd had a pretty great day relaxing there all in all. Once I was home, I started making myself some dinner. When I heard my phone start ringing, I walked over to my purse on the counter and pulled it out. It was my mom. We started talking about the usual things, when all of a sudden, I noticed what looked like a square piece of folded paper sticking out from inside my purse. In the midst of our conversation, my mom continued talking, whilst I pulled this mystery paper out and unfolded it. I was confused because I was absolutely sure I hadn't put anything like that in there. I dropped my phone when I read what was written inside. The note said this, I was going to rob you and stab you in the throat, but you just looked too peaceful laying there. I picked up the phone and told my mom what happened, remembering that girl on the beach. We both nearly passed out together. I'd like to tell you my story now. I was working as a driver for Uber about a year ago. As you might guess, doing that job resulted in meeting many strange people. Many drunk people, quiet people, all sorts of people, and in a few rare cases, some creepy people as well. This story does not involve a creepy person, though. It involves my one and only encounter with a terrifying person. One evening, around 11pm or so, I was getting pretty tired. I had already been working for several hours but I decided to pick up just one more person, then call it a night and go home. This last person's pickup location was in a very bad neighborhood. I had dropped off another group of people here about a week before this night. I pulled up to the house set up as the pickup location and immediately noticed it looked quite run down and vacant as well. It didn't look like anybody should or even could be living in it. All the same though, a man walked out of the house before I could even inform him on my phone that I had arrived. He looked completely normal, which was a huge relief. He jumped in the back and said hello, and thanked me for picking him up from such a strange location. I asked him where he needed to go. He didn't give me the address like I'm used to though. He just told me to head down the street and make a right. I didn't think anything of this. After following his instructions, he told me to then get on the freeway, go about 15 miles, then get off on Lincoln Boulevard. I was happy to hear this, as it wasn't all that far away from where I lived at the time. This being my last ride of the night, 
I didn't want to have to drive a huge distance just to get back home after. After getting off on Lincoln, he told me to drive another four miles up, then make a right turn. After he gave those directions, I started getting a bit uneasy. After driving those four miles and making that right turn, he told me to make a left about a mile up the street. Upon hearing those instructions, I felt even more nervous. Maybe it was just a coincidence, but those were the exact instructions to get to my neighborhood. I followed his instructions and made the left as I was asked to. I asked what was next after this. He didn't say anything for a few moments. I looked in the rearview mirror, only to feel my heart sink. He was just staring at me, with his eyes bug-eyed wide. I repeated myself, and he finally replied, Go another mile, then make a left on Patterson. I can't tell you the level of fear I reached after hearing that. That was the exact same street I lived on. Did this guy know where I lived? Was he directing me back to my house? My heart started to race. I made the left turn, then asked what was next. He responded instantly. Up that street there, my house is on the right. I felt sick. I kept driving and started to slow down a bit. I tried not to look at it as I passed by my own home slowly. Which one is it? He was silent for a moment, then whispered in a quiet and sinister voice. He just passed it. I stopped the car. My heart was now throbbing. I looked in the rearview mirror to see him now smiling. I asked him again which one it was. I was still looking at him. He replied to me without breaking his gaze or his smile. 1905. I jumped out of my car after hearing him say that. That was my address. I started running into the middle of the street. I took out my phone from my pocket and dialed 911. He jumped out of the car on the opposite side of me. I ran into my neighbor's bushes and made the choice to knock on their front door. I pounded furiously for a moment. I turned around to see where the man was. I was expecting to see him right behind me. But now he was nowhere in sight. I told my neighbors what had just happened. A police officer showed up shortly after that but the man was already gone. Your guess is as good as mine as to how he knew where I lived, what my address was. I still have no idea how he knew that. I didn't see him again either. I never picked up another person after that. I have a very scary story to tell you. I was out of work and desperate for cash when I looked on Craigslist under gigs. A few years back, I'd responded to several ads, ranging from painting to helping people move or cleaning on a Sunday morning. Somebody called me and told me they had some work for me. They said the job was to clean a kitchen inside a small building that was recently closed down. He was apparently renovating it and needed me to show up and work in the evening starting at around 7 p.m. and ending at around 1 or 2 in the morning. It was only going to be for tonight, but he promised to pay me in cash. $200, in fact. That sounded just fine to me. I had no problem with those hours either, as my last job was a graveyard shift anyway. So, the man I was talking to gave me the address, and I told him I'd be there right on the dot at 7 o'clock. He sounded like a nice, normal guy. In fact, I showed up a little bit before seven and approached the building. This building was one amongst many others downtown, but for some reason, this one looked eerily lonely. It had no windows and no lights were working outside in front of it either. I thought it might be some sort of bar that was closed down or something. I knocked on the big wooden door when I heard a noise coming from inside. Eventually, a man opened up. He was very tall and had this thick goatee. He looked to be in his 50s or so. He greeted me with a big smile and asked me to come on in. There was a single lamp lighting the room we were in, and indeed it looked like some sort of old bar. The room wrapped around another smaller room in the center of it. It looked as if he was painting the walls and working to fix the top of the bar, which was rotting old wood. He showed me to the central room, which seemed to be the kitchen. 
It was very dirty. All glasses and dishes were laying around everywhere. The oven was pulled out from the wall, showing the rotting drywall behind it. Sawdust and dirt was all over everything. He told me I was to clean this area and get as much done as possible before 2 a.m. I told him I'd work my ass off, and he pointed out some cleaning products sitting on the ground by the wall, with some rags to scrub as well. I asked if he had any gloves or anything. He said no, but that the sink in the corner still worked, and I could clean my hands whenever I wanted with it. That sucked. I was a bit hesitant to clean the stuff in there without gloves, but I remembered that big $200 he promised and moved past my disappointment. He told me while I was cleaning that he was going to be working outside at the bar. I asked where I should begin, and he said scrubbing the baseboards around the room. I told him okay, and he walked out. Fast forwarding a bit, I had been cleaning for about two hours now, and was actually making a fair bit of progress. I was getting very thirsty. I told myself I would finish this one spot before exiting the room to ask if there was anything I could drink. I kicked myself for not thinking to bring a water bottle along with me. After finishing my goal, I stood up, only to realize I'd not heard him working outside the room at all. I hadn't heard anything as a matter of fact. I walked to the door and opened it, only to find darkness, completely pitch black. At that instant, I became very nervous. Hey, uh, man, I'm making some good progress in here, if you want to see. I expected to hear him respond. He didn't, though. I looked around nervously, but I couldn't see anything. The only light source was gone. I looked back into the kitchen, which was bright and all lit up with the lights all on and working in the ceiling. I peered back out into the dark room. I began taking steps out into the room surrounding the kitchen. After taking about ten whole steps, I stopped and was about to speak up again. To my horror, the door had slammed shut behind me. I was now engulfed in blinding darkness. I couldn't see anything. I spun around, waving my arms and walking back toward the kitchen door. My steps were small, as I had no idea what was in front of me. I was afraid I would run into something. In fact, I did, waving my hands around in front of me. I felt them hit something, only it was not a door. I'd smacked right into somebody's face. I scuttled backward, not hearing anything. Whoever I had just touched didn't react at all. I backed up until I hit the back wall and realized I must have been close to the entrance door of the building. I turned around and felt blindly for a doorknob. Luck was on my side. I quickly found it and pulled the door open. It was very dark outside at this point, and only a very small amount of moonlight came into the room. Just enough for me to see the man standing against the kitchen door with a blank expression on his face. I ran out the door and never looked back. That's the last time I used Craigslist to find work. What was that guy doing? What was he going to do? It makes me sick just thinking about it.